please go ahead good evening everyone myself dr neha sinha and myself dr amit rana are the yoga coordinators for the cap us session it is our great honor and pleasure to welcome you all to the first session of the cap knowledge attitude and practices in anesthesiology which is the yoga stars session i quote the words of swami vivekananda the youth are indeed the most dynamic and vibrant segment of the society youth is the source of strength dynamism and enthusiasm now carrying this enthusiasm forward i would like to invite dr nishank sahai additional professor ames patna and dr monika chikara associate professor pgms rotak the chief coordinators for the us stars cap session thank you dr neha and dr amit good evening everyone and i welcome you all to witness the first session of knowledge attitude and practice series as the focus of teaching is shifting from a knowledge based approach to a skill based learning attitude uh, learning attitude and practice along with basic knowledge plays a significant part in carving our proficiencies in this series there will be a participation of anesthesiologists from all the domains right from post graduates senior residents consultants and private practitioners we will be beginning this academic series with a session of yuva stars where yuva anesthesiologists aged 40 years or less will express themselves under the guidance of renowned and experienced academicians now dr nishant will introduce the guiding force behind this academic extravaganza and the man behind the inception and implementation of this series dr navin uh thank you dr monica and uh, you know it is uh, such an absolute honor and privilege to be sharing screen with sir and being associated with the uh, sir himself obviously in any academic circles or any anesthesia circles uh, dr navin malhotra sir does not need any introduction he has been our own secretary iisa secretary national from 18 to 22 and uh, sir has taken the iisa to, to such dizzying heights and work done by dr navin malhotra during the last 3 4 years is not unknown to any and if you watch some of his talks or orations he speaks from his heart he is a leader who thinks about the youth the yuva iisa is his creation the yuva iisa con at gurugram gave the young anesthesiologist of this country a great platform to launch from and not only is he an astute leader but he is an acute astute uh, academician also he has won the iisa bhopal uh, award for academic excellence he has won the kpr young anesthesiologist national award and uh, uh, sir in areas of interest are pain management and cardiac so you are muted nishant sir dr nishant can you please unmute yourself okay okay uh, am i audible now yeah so was i muted throughout or was it uh, just now no no, no, no just uh, just few seconds back okay so uh, so that is the introduction i mean dr navin malhotra sir does not need any introduction may I request my mentor my guide and i dare say like an elder brother to me and many people like me to please carry forward the session sir navin malhotra sir thank you uh, nishant and monica for such warm words respected teachers seniors colleagues friends and dear students greetings to all of you welcome to knowledge attitude and practices in anesthesiology academic series today's session of cap academic series is yuva stars today our honorable prime minister was in sydney has given a statement that world's largest yuva factory is in india world's largest yuva factory is in india and it's an apt moment for us that today we are starting our cap academic series focusing on the brilliant yuva stars of the country who shall be guided by renowned academicians of the stature of professor tejke call 
डॉक्टर गोपीनाथ सर एंड डॉक्टर सुदर्शन कस्तूरी राउड कैंडिशन नॉट ओनली इन इंडिया बट इंटरनेशनली दे आर टीचर्स ऑफ टीचर्स दे हैव प्रोड्यूस टॉट गाइडेड थाउजेंड एंड थाउजेंड ऑफ द स्टूडेंट्स थाउजेंड्स एंड थाउजेंड्स ऑफ द स्टूडेंट्स I am very very thankful to all of you, the respected chairpersons, that you are here today to guide and handhold our UA stars, our UA star speakers, who shall be sharing their knowledge, experience, ex youth with all of us today over the next around two hours or so. And I also thank. our chief coordinators dr monica chikara dr nishan sahay who have been working for the uisa over the last more than 3 years thank you for your support and cooperation and the uva coordinators dr amit rana and dr neha sina who echoes the sentiments of uva anesthesiologists i also place on record my sense of greetings to our media partner anesthesia tv as this program is streamed live on anesthesia tv and in, led by mr rahul chobe so i hand it over back to dr monica and dr nishan to carry forward the proceedings and let the academics flow thank you very much over to you monica thank you sir now i would like to uh, introduce the, our speakers for today are you are anesthesiologists and uh, our first speaker for the, the today's session Our esteemed chairpersons, please, Monica. Uh, We have uh, at the formal uh, at the back uh, introduction. Our first chairperson is Professor Tej K. Kaul sir, who is a teacher, friend, philosopher, and guide. Who has been the HOD of Dhanand Medical College and Hospital, Ludhiana, and uh, has been the past. president of isa north zone also dr gopinath sir is from hyderabad teachers of teachers and has got numerous international and national publications to his credit a man who is known for his simplicity love affection and his down to earth image sir always guides us uh, academically also clinically also in research also and in our day to day life also and i got dr sudarshan kasturi basically sir uh, is from coimbatore but now he is serving in uh, giving his uh, valuable services for a short period of time in kuwait he has been the past uh, president of isa tamil nadu state branch and has been a very uh, vibrant branch uh, during his tenure now also and he is academically uh, lots and lots of experience especially and laparoscopic surgery so i welcome all the three chairpersons to our cap academic series uva star session thank you for joining us today thank you so much sir so now i would like to introduce our speakers for today our first speaker is dr nitin choudhury he is assistant professor in aims new delhi and his major achievements include dr arvind patel award dr padmakant award 2017 and 2019 dr g k sinha young researcher award tomila jit bird award <laughs> bal bhadra call award and basdo koshalya award he is executive member of iapa delhi chapter and he is a reviewer in national and international journals his areas of interest include pediatric anesthesia obstetrics and bariatric anesthesia welcome dr nitin 
I hand over to you to start your session. Dr. Nitin. Yeah, thank you, ma'am, for your kind introduction. Um, can you allow me the screen sharing, please? Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for your kind introduction. And to begin with, I would like to thank uh, Naveen, sir, for giving this wonderful opportunity to all of us and uh, considering us as uh, worthy enough to be here on this platform, sharing this platform with such eminent personalities who we have looked uh, as we have entered into the field of anesthesia till date and we have learned so much from them. So it's uh, an honor for me to be here and an honor to be presenting a topic which is very dear to me. Uh, and I'll be talking about the laparoscopic surgeries in the pediatric subset and what are the anesthetic considerations in these patients. So an overview of what I'll be talking about, brief introduction, what are the advantages and disadvantages of laparoscopic surgeries, what are the various indications of the surgeries, the pathophysiological effects of laparoscopy, the anesthetic management, and a brief note on the ERAS, and then we'll quickly summarize as to what we have really talked about in this lecture. Now, laparoscopy is not something very recent. It was first India, it dates back to 1980s when Dr. Vinod Kapoor did the first laparoscopic surgery in a pediatric patient in Mumbai. Now, why are we talking so much about the laparoscopic surgery? Because the benefits outweigh the risks that are associated. It is the present. It is definitely the future. And as we see, more and more surgeries are being done laparoscopically. So in coming years, maybe open surgeries will be limited to very few indications and maybe all we'll be doing is laparoscopic surgeries. So why laparoscopic surgery? The basic advantage that it has is the wound size. There's a minimal incision that is given and which gives a numerous advantages to us in terms of decreased tissue trauma, the infection site, uh, the infection incidence is lower, the herniations are lower. It allows the patient to mobilize, allows the patient to be discharged. The hospital stay is less. Financially, it is more economical for the patient and also for the economy of the country as a whole. Also, the incidence of post-operative adhesions and post-operative ileus is less because you're having a less handling of the organ tissues. The heat loss is less, the hypothermia. These are numerous advantages it has. Now, like the coin has two faces, it too has certain disadvantages. So let's talk about what are the disadvantages. Firstly, you're not able to feel the tissue. So sometimes maybe a clinical precision or clinical diagnosis may be missed just because you're, you're not able to feel what you're really doing. Secondly, the loss of orientation of the space and the depth. Then a two-dimensional structure, the difficulty in controlling the bleeding, and difficult tissue resection. These two can still be overcome if you are someone who's been doing laparoscopic surgery for a very long time and have acquired the skills. Coming to the two-dimensional imaging, now we have techniques where three-dimensional images are also available, and you have different dyes which give you a, a better vision, a better perception of the depth. So maybe in years to come, these disadvantages perhaps will come down to a very few. Now, the indications. The indications are outgrowing. They have increased. They have increased in numbers from just limited to abdominal surgeries to begin with. Now they are numerous in abdominal, in the urogenital procedures like opcutopexy, pyeloplasty, nephrectomy, adrenalectomy, and even the neonatal procedures are being done laparoscopically, which perhaps we never thought of. Neonatal procedures like duodenal atresia, CDH, pull-through procedures, and lat procedures, they're all being done laparoscopically in various centers across the world. So let's talk about the pathophysiology of this nemopeditoneum that the laparoscopy does, because this will help us in understanding how do we go about and what are we supposed to do when we give anesthesia to a patient who's undergoing laparoscopy. 
Firstly, let's talk about the cardiovascular system. Now, what happens in the cardiovascular system is that your mean arterial and the systemic vascular resistance tends to increase because of the hypercarbia, the neuroendocrine response that is generated by the surgery and the increased intra-abdominal pressure. The cardiac filling pressures also increase because the intra-thoracic pressure increases and thereby the venous return increases. And the sympathetic tone is increased because of the neuroendocrine response, the catecholamine surges that occur because of the pneumoperitoneum. Now, the cardiac index may remain unaffected or it may decrease. It decreases in case if there's an increased afterload or a decreased venous return or a decreased cardiac filling. And it may remain unaffected if the intravascular volume has been maintained, a position which may favor a cardiac filling, for example, a Trendlenburg position or the patient's preoperative status also has to do. If the patient is a cardiac Otherwise, patient, my yes, is it will get affected. But if the patient is a normal ASA1 patient, then it's very unlikely that you will have a problem with the cardiac filling. Coming to the cardiac arrhythmias, they may have brady or tachyarrhythmias. The brady arrhythmias we all know are because of the peritoneal stretch, which stimulates the vagus. So at the time of VD's needle incision or at the time of pneumoperitoneum, you have to be extra careful that the vagal reflex can be exaggerated. Tachyarrhythmias can be because of hypercarbia, hypoxia, or any complication per se because of the laparoscopic surgery like the capnothorax or the pulmonary embolism. So the clinical implications is if you are doing with the neonates, then you have to understand that they have a reduced or rather a fixed cardiac contractility. So they may not be able to bear the hemodynamic repercussions of pneumoperitoneum. So you have to be very careful. Secondly, that they tend to have a high vagal tone. So they are more susceptible for any vagal stimulation. And lastly, if you go for a lower intra-abdominal pressure, then the venous return that is decreased can be easily compensated by the splanchanic distribution. Therefore, one should be careful and one should go for a smaller rate or a slower rate of gas insufflation, mostly less than one liter per minute. Try and keep your intra-abdominal pressure the least. Six centimeters of water in infants and neonates is considerable to be uh, for doing a surgery. And in older patients, you may increase it up to 12 centimeters. And vagal attacks should always be at hand in case of any vagal stimulation. Coming to the respiratory system. Now, basically, you need to understand the uh, the respiratory mechanics, how it is impaired because of pneumoperitoneum. Now, these are the three figures that I have. In one, you have a patient who has not undergone a pneumoperitoneum creation. So you can see the lungs are fully expanded, resting on the diaphragm. In B, the pneumoperitoneum has been created, which has pushed the diaphragm cephalate and has decreased the FRC, the lung volumes, and has decreased the thoracic compliance. And C is basically when Apart from the pneumoperitoneum, we have also given a position like a Trendlenburg position, which has further aggravated the, uh, or maybe has decreased the lung compliance and have made the things worse. So this is one thing that you have to take into consideration. The other thing is the transpulmonary pressure. Now, what is exactly this transpulmonary pressure? It is basically a difference between the alveolar pressure and the intrapleural pressure. Now, we are very much worried about the high pressure. Uh, airway pressures that we see in these patients or when we are giving laparoscope, when you're doing a laparoscopic surgery. But what we need to think about is the transpulmonary pressure because it is the pressure which defines the injury to the lung parenchyma. Now, again, here we have three diagrams. In the first diagram, you have, we are just showing the alveolar pressure. In the second one, you are showing the alveolar pressure and we are also talking about the active inspiration. So the transpulmonary pressure tends to increase and there can be injury to the lung parenchyma. And in third, we are talking about the pneumoperitoneum. Now, pneumoperitoneum, what it does is it increases the pulmonary, intrapulmonary pressure, and thereby it basically decreases the transpulmonary pressure. So on the contrary, it actually helps you in decreasing the injury to the lung parenchyma. So maybe the pressures that are reflected are high, but the amount of injury that is there at the lung parenchyma may not be so much as much as we are worried about. Now, coming to the parameters. So the function of residual capacity of the lung compliance, they tend to decrease as we have already discussed. The PaO2, that is the arterial oxygen, may decrease because of the atelectasis or the hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction or the pre-op status, the pre-op pulmonary status of the patient per se. The carbon dioxide definitely increases because of the pneumoperitoneum is created by CO2 and the CO2 is absorbed into the system and also the respiratory mechanics which get hampered because of the pneumoperitoneum. So they together leads to an increase in the PaCO2. Now, what all other factors will affect their pulmonary problems? First is the age, that is in pediatrics, uh, in neonates and in infants, it will be exaggerated. The weight, if it's an obese child or a preoperative pulmonary function are already deranged for a patient. If you have given a steep Trendlenburg position, your anesthetic drugs, if they tend to 
um, aggravate the hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction and also your ventilation technique. If you're not adequately ventilating your patient, in that case, you might have difficulty in managing these patients. So clinically, if I talk about what all we need to take into consideration, since we will be facing atelectasis, it's advisable to use PEEP in these patients. A three to five centimeters of water, of uh, PEEP of five centimeters of water is good enough. VQ mismatch will be exaggerated in these patients because of the anesthesia per se and because of the increase in the uh, decrease in the FRC and the uh, also the, uh, the VQ mismatch that will happen. Now, there will be an increase in the carbon dioxide absorption. As compared to the adults, it is more in the pediatric patients. Why? Because of the larger surface area in relation to the body weight, that is one. Secondly, there's a distance between the capillary and the cirrhosal surface is less, so it is very thin. So the absorption is very quick and it doesn't, it doesn't take that long. Also, there is a lower peritoneal fat, which doesn't prevent, you know, if you have more fat, then it acts as a barrier for the carbon dioxide to be absorbed in the system. But in the pediatric patient, it is less, so the absorption is increased. Also, you need to consider that in neonates, they might have a transitional circulation. So if your pulmonary pressure is increased, then the fetal shunts can open. And in that case, you might have a shunt, fetal shunts working in and you might land up with hypoxia in these patients. So you have to be careful in the neonates. Therefore, one has to see that depending upon the position of the patient and the patient that you're dealing with, there are chances of endobronchial intubation in these patients. You might have to increase the minute ventilation by 60%, up to 60% to maintain the normal carpia. The patients who are less than 10 years of age, in those patients, there are increased chances of airway closures. An increased entire carbon dioxide is seen in neonates and infants. Other than the increased absorption, it may be also because of the smaller airway caliper and the dead space because of the circuits that we're using. The central nervous system is also affected by the neoperitoneum. It tends to increase the intracranial pressure because of the hypercarbia, the increased SVR, and the Trellenberg position. So the cerebral perfusion pressure is hampered. So you have to, a word of caution would be that in patients who are increased ICP or have a VP shunt in situ, it can be a relative contraindication to do laparoscopic surgery in these patients. The other systems which are affected are the renal system. Now in renal system, there's a decreased perfusion in the cortical and the medullary zone. And also it decreases the renal function and the renal output. So this is because of the increased uh, IAP and also because of the various mediators that are released. There is an increase in the plasma renin activity and ADH is also increased the endothelin and the nitric oxide. They all together results in decreased perfusion of the renal system. So one needs to be, one needs to understand that you need not give fluids to these patients because that has caused more morbidity and mortality in these patients. So in, you need to understand that it is the pneumoperitoneum which is causing it. And once the pneumoperitoneum is over, the kidneys will start getting perfused and you will have a urine output. So wait and watch is the uh, should be the mantra for it. Gastrointestinal tract, again, the intragastric pressure increases. So the chances of risk of aspirations are more. It can cause venostasis. So in case of the prolonged surgeries, the patient might have thrombosis issues. And intraocular pressure also increases because of the increase in the intra-abdominal pressure and also the position will also further aggravate your intraocular pressures. So let's talk about how do you manage these patients. So the pre-anesthetic checker, checker for these patients will be exactly the same as you do for a patient who has come for a non-laparoscopic surgery. So you have to examine systemically, you have to see the check for the history of the patient, the systemic examination of the patient, the airway examination of the patient, you have to identify if there is any chronic or acute problems that may affect your plan of anesthesia. If you might have some undiagnosed conditions like a congenital syndrome or a congenital heart disease or any difficulty in the airway, you need to understand that. And then again, the disease specific complications that can be there. For example, if a patient has come for a uh, reflex disease, in that case, he might have a concurrent pneumonia. So you need to watch for that or electasis or renal failure, systemic sepsis. So you need to understand the disease specific complications also. So what are the relative content indication? When would you actually not go for it? So there are very few uh, indications, maybe a patient who's hypothermic because it further tends to increase or uh, decrease the uh, temperature. Uh, the patient is on inotropic suppose because you're already going to harm the uh, cardiac stability with the pneumoperitoneum. So a patient who's on inotropic suppose may not be able to withheld that. And unexplained resistant arrhythmias, a compromised cardiac contractility, if the patient has got severe respiratory uh, compromise or a raised ICP, as I already talked about. So these will be relative contraindications to it. 
Now, if the patient comes to you, would you go for a pre-medication or not? Ideally, you should go for a pre-medication unless the child is a neonate or has less than nine months of age. That is because then the stranger or the separation anxiety doesn't come into picture. Other than that, you should be administering. If the patient is more than nine years, if the patient has an IQ where he can be, he can understand what you're trying to do, what you're trying to explain to the patient. In that case, you may avoid pre-medications, but if not, then you may very well go ahead with pre-medication. Various pre-medications are available and depending upon your setup and your expertise, you can go ahead with it. Coming to the induction of anesthesia. Now, you can go for an inhalation or an intravenous depending upon the patient profile, depending upon the surgery that you're going for, depending upon the risk of aspiration and the, whether you have an IV in situ or not. So that will be defined whether you would go for an inhalation or an intravenous. Now, if you have to take an intravenous, Dr. Hello. Now we can hear you. Nitin, you will have to restart uh, within last one slide because I think your internet was lost. Oh, sorry, sorry. If your bandwidth is slow, switch off the video, Dr. Nitin, please. Which was the last slide, sir? I will I'll continue with that. Uh, the pre-medication one. Pre-medication. Okay, I'll start. Okay, I'll start with the induction. No. Thank you. Continue. Okay. So coming to the induction. It could be inhalation or intravenous depending upon your patient profile, the type of surgery that the patient is going in, or whether you have an IV in situ or not. In case you have to secure an IV, preferably go for an upper limb because an IV in the lower limb, what, what would happen is when you create a pneumoporitoneum, the drug will take time to reach the circulation and thereby there will be a delayed effect of the drug. Now, one very important and debatable issue is which airway device should be used. Should we go for a cuffed endotracheal tube or should we go for a supraglottic airway device? Now, there are certain things that you need to keep into mind and answer these questions before you choose your device. First is the risk of aspiration because of the increased intragastric pressure the PEEP that you want to administer to the patient, how high are you anticipating the uh, the inspiratory pressures to be, and the patient's position, whether it will be a trendlin bug, it will be a reverse trendlin bug, or a lateral position. So you have to take these things into consideration before you talk about it. Let's talk about what is the current literature about the use of the supraglottic airway devices. So in this study, in 2019, they did a prospective study on 100 patients where they talked about using an IGEL as a AV device in the laparoscopic surgery, and they found that IGEL had adequate ventilation in these patients, and they do not face any adverse events because of it. In another study, they compared the IGEL with endotracheal tube, and they found that IGEL was comparable in terms of the adequacy of the ventilation. And contrary, they found that the peak airway pressures were supposedly less with IGEL as compared to the endotracheal tube, maybe because of the tube within a tube causes more resistance, which was uh, bypassed when we used an IGEL. And the complications were fewer, maybe because of the airway morbidity that we all know with the supraglottic devices is less as compared to the endotracheal tubes. In another study, which is a recent study in 2022, where they come where they compared three supraglottic airway devices, an AMBO again, an IGEL, and a Procele, and they found that IGEL had the maximum oropharyngeal leak pressures as compared to the other two devices. And they think that it can be used very well in higher ventilatory pressures also. So we need to see in our setup and how confident and about our expertise, whether we want to go for an endotracheal tube or a supraglottic. Thereafter, you have to be, you have to place a nasogastric tube because of the visualization that the surgeon wants. If there is a stomach distension, he may not be able to operate on the patient. If it's a 
uh, laparoscopic cholecystectomy, a catheterization for a prolonged surgery, and the positioning. Whenever you position the patient, you need to be careful that you are not doing any harm to this patient. So do a proper padding, make sure that all the pressure areas have been covered and, echo, and then go for a surgery in these patients. Monitoring is a very important thing that you have to consider in these patients. Other than the standard ASA monitoring that we have, an entire carbon dioxide is an essential. It is a mandatory thing when you're going for a laparoscopic surgery. Other thing is a temperature monitoring because in laparoscopic surgeries, there's a fall in temperature which has been seen. If you have an insufflator which can uh, take, uh, which can warm the gases. In that case, you can still uh, boycott it, but in, uh, otherwise you should be using it. Even the ASA says that for any surgery lasting more than 30 minutes, temperature monitoring should be done. Intra-arterial blood pressure may be in very specific patients where you are, uh, who maybe have, who have a cardiac compromise, a cerebral oxygenation maybe. If you are going for a long duration surgery, you may be in a Trenlenburg position. And mentality considerations would be whether you want to go for a volume control or a pressure control. With pressure control, you should take into consideration that the tidal volume will get affected with the intra-abdominal pressure. So keep a check when the pneumoperitoneum is created that your inspiratory pressures are increased after it. And once the pneumoperitoneum is deflated, then the inspiratory pressures are decreased. Otherwise, you may have a hypo or a hyperventilation in these patients. PEEP should always be administered to these patients and FiO2 will depend upon the patient's requirement and the respiratory status of the patient. Now, coming to the monitoring, now people actually did monitoring where they did a cerebral, renal, peripheral, and they, uh, an entire carbon dioxide, and they found that it had uh, the pneumoperitoneum had very limited effect on all of these. So we can very safely go ahead with uh, doing laparoscopic surgeries in an ASA 1 and 2 patients. Again, it was found that uh, when they compared the two pressures, one was 10, 10 uh, mmHg and 14, they found that with the higher uh, pressures, the decrease, the cerebral oxygenation was decreased with a higher pressure. So again, a, a mind of caution, word of caution that we should go for a lower pressures as much as possible. So while and coming to the maintenance of anesthesia, go for inhalationals, neuromuscular blockage should be given because it makes the muscle wall more compliant, more pliable, and will give more space for the surgeons to operate. Opioids are regional anesthesia techniques. Again, regional anesthesia techniques will be discussed in the subsequent lecture. Nitrous is one thing, which is again a debatable thing. Should we use or not? We don't use it and there are numerous reasons for it. The power and distension makes it technically difficult for the surgeon. It is a combustible gas. PONV again is one thing that you don't want if you're following an ERAS guidelines and the distension of the nemoperitoneum per se, because nemoperitoneum again is a closed cavity and nitrous tends to distend it further. So your intra-abnormal pressures will actually increase with nitrous, ox nitrous oxide. Fluid administration should be washed for because uh, the insensible losses and the water loss is less when you're doing for a laparoscopic surgery. So do not go by the same standards that you're doing for any other surgery, an open surgery. Uh, when you're extubating these patients, ensure that normocapnia has been established before you go for your extubation and the blockage of the neuromuscular uh, agents that you have given. Adequate analgesia should be ensured, normothermia and anti emetics should be given to these patients. Now, lastly, I would like to talk about the ERAS, that is the enhanced recovery after anesthesia. Now, there were too many arguments against and it was only in 2018 that ERAS for the pediatric uh, patients actually came up. So, there were a lot of uh, arguments against it. So, people were like, ERAS is basically for uh, patients who have got increased morbidity and mortality and children on the contrary have got a better physiology. So, why should we go for ERAS? And the other set was... There is, a, there, there is a wide spectrum in pediatric patients from the neonates to the grown-up children. So the stages of physiological and neurological developments are different and can we actually extrapolate the data of the adults in these patients? The other was the lack of the high evidence for certain elements of ERAS like the thromboembolism profile axis and the belief that we are already doing ERAS in our setups and the concern that will a pediatric patient if we discharge them on the same day, will the admission, readmission rates increase or not? So these were the fears and these were the uh, uh, arguments against it. But however, people still came up with a protocol. The elements of ERAS protocol for pediatrics are the same as that we have for adults. The only two things that we don't follow in an ERAS protocol for pediatrics is firstly, is the minimize the use of the mechanical bowel preparation and the use of insulin to control the severe hyperglycemia in ICU. Other than this, all the 19 interventions that are being uh, escalated for adults can very well be extrapolated to the pediatric subset. So a few uh, 
studies who have actually used ERAS first in, in acute appendicitis patients they have used and they found that it increases the patient's comfort, decreases the post-operative complications, and reduces the hospital stay and increases the speed of recovery. Again, ERAS was used in the gastrointestinal surgeries and they found that it again increased the patient comfort, decreased the duration and the stay and has better post-operative rehabilitation when they used ERAS in these patients. The other was using ERAS in patients of IBD and they also found that ERAS tends to decrease the opioid requirement and the time to feeding was significantly decreased when ERAS protocol was followed. So ERAS is something that is new and ERAS is something which should be inculcated for a better patient outcome. Therefore, to conclude, I would like to say that an understanding of the pathophysiology of a pneumoperitoneum is very essential for uh, giving anesthesia to the lapro uh, to pediatric patients undergoing laparoscopic surgeries and it will help you to understand the basics behind giving anesthesia to these patients. The anesthesia technique has to be tailored as, uh, based on the patient's profile and the surgical requirement. Be prepared for the anticipated complications that you know of uh, in a laparoscopic subset and inculcate the ERAS practice guidelines in your clinical practice for a better patient outcome. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Nitin. Now, uh, we'll take up the discussion and question answers later. Okay, ma'am. So, now I, I would like to invite our next speaker. Dr. Shweta. Dr. Shweta is assistant professor in Nilofar Hospital, Osmania Med Medical College, Hyderabad, and she is WFSA scholar, ISA Young Talent in Anesthesiology Award 2022, executive committee member of ISA and IAPA Hyderabad, and she is founder of Srishti Project to Save Girl Child. Her areas of interest are pediatric and OBS anesthesia. Dr. Shweta, I would welcome you and please go ahead with your talk. Thank you, ma'am. Good evening, everybody. Um, today, my topic is Trunkle Blocks in Pediatric Anesthesia. Yes, yes. Yeah. You can unmute yourself. Yes, it's in the link, ma'am. I'm just sending. By the time Dr. Shweta projects her slides, uh, I must place on record her commitment towards today's academic session. Uh, she was not physically fit today, but because of her strong commitment, to the US Star Academic session. Uh, she has joined us in spite of her not so good health. Uh, thank you, Dr. Shweta, for joining us today. Dr. Shweta, please. Thank you, sir. Sir, can you able to see the screen? Yes, we are able to see your screen. Okay. Right, right. So the topic for today is abdominal trunkal blocks in pediatric regional anesthesia. As we all know, today, uh, ultrasound has become so much in the wide importance that in and out every day in our anesthesia practice, we are using both for the adults as well as the pediatric. And today we'll be discussing about the ultrasound guided abdominal blocks, the benefits, anatomical and physiological considerations, the local anesthetics and the technique, the current applications and the limitations and the review of the current literature. The practice of regional anesthesia in children differs somewhat from that of the adults in that the majority of the cases, it is used for analgesia and performed. And here in pediatrics, it is performed as a multimodal anesthesia with the support of the general anesthesia or the sedation. 
First, it was described in 94 by Caprell et al. The unique feature of the ultrasounded guided trunkal blocks is that in all of these techniques, in contrast to the peripheral nerve blocks, no nerve or the plexus needs to be identified. Now, real-time imaging of the nerves and their surrounding structures, this not only increases the rate of achieving a successful block by allowing visualization of the injected entering the correct plane, but can also reduce the complication rates as the surrounding structures injury can be avoided. There are studies which are identified there is a trend which is moving away from the central neuroaxial blockade towards the peripheral nerve catheter techniques and the truncal blocks. Advances in other uh, reasons include advancement in the minimally invasive surgeries, ambulatory surgeries, the more of day case surgeries these days has emerged the use of the truncal blocks which has uh, given a very good benefit to the patients as well as the parents as well as to the hospital setup. The more predictable administration of these techniques in modern regional anesthesia practice makes it for use uh, in our day-to-day -day life. Now, what are the benefits, especially to the patients and the the patients, it is a reduced risk of the uh, MAC. There is a reduced requirement of the opioids and other analgesics. And there is a hemodynamic stability and reduced requirement of post ventilatory support. There is also obtains the hormonal stress response, reduced in drop rate to blood loss. And there is an improved GI function, early recovery. And uh, there is a definitely uh, easier to for the nursing it is easy and also the pain-free children are less labor intensive to care for. And even for the parents, they are more of comfort zone, not panic or anxiety. And there is a, a rapid discharge from the first stage recovery and reduced requirement for the post-op ventilatory support. And there is a reduced length of the stay and the cost economically as well. The specific advantages of the pediatric ultrasound guider region <coughs> Anesthesia is, it is mainly the lower levels of the ossification in the pediatric patients. There are larger echo windows that can be used to visualize inside the spinal column. And a lower volume of the local anesthetic allows for multiple blocks to be performed within the maximum dose of the local anesthetic. So the local anesthetic dosage, uh, we are ensuring that toxic dosage is not crossed for all the patients. So we need to keep the dosage range within the toxic maximum, not uh, crossing the toxic dosage. And infant's anatomy is compact and the risk of damage is greater. But visualization of the nerve and other uh, adjacent structures makes for an inherently safer technique. Now, as we all know, for any block or for any patient, there is a very important key role which plays a role in the pre anesthetic checkup, including the counseling of the patient, depending upon the age of the patient and the counseling of the parents as well. And uh, we all know that the anxiety, the uh, parent separation anxiety also increases the more of the pain or the morbidity in the post-operative care. So the counseling and the really spending time with the babies, if it is a very small child in the uh, pre anesthetic checkup and uh, having a really uh, colorful uh, toys along with them, giving the mother's uh, support with the child really enhances the recovery of the patient and also the acceptance. The surgical and the block site, we really have to look at the what is the surgical site and the rechecking the block site and the resuscitation equipment, whether it is ready, including all the emergency drugs and the including the lipid emulsions, including the antiarrhythmics, all the emergency drugs, monitors, uh, ETCO2, uh, NIBP, ECG, SPO2, airway, yeah, all the airway, difficult airway cart, IV access, good IV access is prime important before uh, applying for any uh, regional anesthesia block. Then the probe size, appropriate probe size. Usually we use the linear probes or the hockey stick for the uh, very small child. And the ergonomics, ergonomics is very important. The way we position uh, the alignment is very critical for uh, providing the block. And the trained, skilled anesthesiologist 
who are skilled for the uh, ultrasound guided now blocks with a trained assistant and the preparation under aseptic precautions because we know that especially with the catheter techniques it is very much sepsis and uh, there are high chances of the septic environment and patient positioning depending upon the block there are different positions uh, for example in erector spinae we usually prefer in the lateral position or in the sitting position even in the quadratus lumborum block whereas in the rectus sheath block it is in the supine position and even in the tab block the transfer subdominus plane block it is in the supine position or a lateral lateral tilt then what is the differences usually it is a pediatric nervous system we know that myelination is not very prominently developed even the nociceptive pathways the receptive field of a neuron is large and the descending inhibitory pathways are immature physiological immaturities of the neonatal liver in liver in association with the relatively high cardiac output and the lower levels of the local anesthetic binding proteins that is alpha 1 acid glycoprotein and albumin <coughs> the clearance of these drugs is decreased in those less than the 3 months of age the these are the uh, certain uh, blocks with the indication what are the type of surgeries which can be done using this blocks which will add up to the multimodal analgesia and the local anesthetic volume per kg transfer subdominus block it is unilateral or bilateral it is used the uh, common surgeries are open appendectomies inguinal hernia orthopsis colostomy subumbilical midline incisions laparotomies and the dosage is 0.3 to 0.5 ml per side subcostal tap is a one part of the transfer subdominus which is done superiorly along the subcostal region usually done for the cholecystectomy so the pec 0.3 to 0.5 ml per side rectus sheath umbilical herniotomy or these surgeries which are in the midline midline incisions those surgeries uh, where we can use the rectus sheath block 0.2 to 0.3 ml and the ilioinguinal usually the surgeries over the inguinal region inguinal herniotomies uh, or the uh, scrotal surgeries 0.2 to 0.3 ml per kg then the penile then the unilateral paravertebral or bilateral paravertebral <laughs> the equipment ultrasound machine being available which is charged and working correctly in children less than 10 kg it may be prudent to start off with the saline in your syringe then swap to the local anesthetic when we are satisfied with the needle tip position rather than inadvertent injection of the local anesthetic just to locate rather than that first use the saline and for most pediatric no blocks a linear probe of greater than 10 megahertz is appropriate and the probe of 25 mm width for those patients under 15 kg and a 50 mm probe in those patients greater than 15 ergonomic and there is a scout scan is performed to locate the target nerve or the facial plane and to identify vulnerable structures such as vessels using the color doppler the depth should be adjusted so that the target is in the mid middle of the screen and the gain is optimized both in plane and out of the plane techniques can be used in plane technique is uh, used and it gives a greater needle visibility <coughs> transfer subdominus uh, plane block it is first described in 2004 by macdonell and ultrasound guided technique by the hebbard et al 2008 in 2007 the anterior branches of the intercostal nerves t6 to l1 that innervate the anterior abdominal wall along with anterior rami of the first spinal nerve travel in the plane between internal oblique which is the thickest muscle and the transverse abdominis muscle the analgesia it gives the analgesia to both anterior and lateral abdominal wall the post operative analgesic strategy after unilateral lower abdominal surgery such as hernias and appendectomies or bilaterally for uh, procedures uh, under the subumbilical regions or laparotomies then in plane ultrasound technique again we have the dose 0.3 ml per kg and in most of the cases the routinely we use 0.25% per kg so if we look at the anatomy this is the muscles in the abdominal wall and laterally if we can see there is a three bands three muscle bands and the uh, the superficial one is the external oblique the middle one is the which is the largest thickest one is the internal oblique and the deeper one is the transverse abdominis 
So these are the band of the muscles which extend from posterior to the anterior and covering the lateral part of the abdomen. But if you look at the posterior limb near the vertebral body, we have a, the most posterior one, the erector spine. And little laterally, we fit come, it is a latissimus dorsi. Anterior to the latissimus, it is a quadratus lumborum. And which embedding onto the vertebral body, it is a psoas major. So this is the an anatomy. And uh, this gives a very clear picture for all of most of the blocks, what we are going to do, like uh, transverse abdominus blocks, erector spinal block, quadratus lumborum, all the blocks, even the rectus shape. So if we see anteriorly, we have the rectus abdominis muscle and uh, we see the uh, nerve, the spinal nerves which emerge from the foramen here and it is traversing between the psoas major as well as the quadratus lumborum and it is running along the lateral wall of the abdomen wall between the in the plane of transverse abdominis plane and it is running anteriorly and piercing the rectus sheath and giving the anterior cutaneous nerve. Now if we see there is a branch which is given laterally uh, uh, posterior to the midaxillary line is a, another branch it is a lateral cutaneous nerve branch which pierces the uh, oblique muscles and goes laterally and superficially to supply the anterior lateral and the posterior lateral part of the abdominal wall. So it is advisable to always give the block little posterior to the midaxillary line so that lateral cutaneous nerve is not spared. The, there are different approaches posterior approach, lateral approach, and oblique subcostal. Oblique subcostal is also called as OSTAP. Now, injection in the subcostal area, the, the local anesthetic is injected between the posterior rectus sheath and the transverse abdominis. There is a lateral approach, which is usually, um, posterior approach is usually used for the landmark based. So these are the different techniques for subcostal, lateral, uh, anterior, and the posterior. Now, If you see the transverse abdominis block, this is in the medial side. Now, as we see, this is the medial part and this thickest muscle is the internal oblique, the thick, thick one. Now, as we go the laterally, we see the three muscles. We are going the posterior to the midaxillary line so that we can see the transverse abdominis ending. So that is the best place, best point to get the injection so that it spreads uh, even the lateral cutaneous and the anterior cutaneous nerve are blocked and it gives a much wider area uh, analgesia for the uh, anterior lateral abdominal wall. So this is the injection which is given in between the internal oblique and the transverse abdominus plane in the plane and we can see that it is in the inline technique. It is done in the supine position inline technique the probe and we can see the separation of the fascia in the between the internal oblique and the transverse abdominus. The pro placement is between the iliac crest as well as the um, lower rib, posterior to the midaxillary line. Now let's go to the rectus sheath block. We all know the rectus abdominis is a vertical muscle of the anterior abdominal wall. The muscle is divided into compartments by the linea alba, linea semilanus, and the transverse fibrous branches. T9 to T11 lie posterior to the muscle and anterior to the posterior rectus sheath. Usually we use a, a linear probe again and the short bevel tip of 25 to 50 mm needle, local anesthetic 0.1 to 0.2 mm per kg per side. So as we see, the probe is put on the transverse uh, plane and above the umbilicus and we can see the rectus abdominis muscle is uh, uh, embedded in the sheath, which is uh, the sheath, the common sheath, which is uh, coming from the all the three bands of the uh, muscles that is external oblique and internal oblique and transverse abdominis, all this sheath, they uh, embed, the, the rectus sheath muscle is embedded between these two sheath, anterior sheath and the posterior sheath. Now, the point of giving the block is at the posterior sheath. So, 
So if we see the thickest muscle is the rectus abdominis muscle and we are going the going through the rectus abdominis and injecting the drug posterior to the posterior in the posterior rectus sheet so we can see the separation of the rectus muscle which is going up lifting up usually as i said the surgeries which are around the umbilicus like hernias epigastric or umbilical hernias pyloromyotomies laparoscopic surgeries or midline abdominal incisions the complications it is compared to other blocks it is a good safety profile with minimum complications but for any other block the common complications that is intraperitoneal injections abdominal visceral inju injuries and intravascular injections should be taken care quadratus lumborum it is a posterior extension of the transverse abdominis block and was first described by dr blanco and it was later modified it was later modified by sauter et al the transmuscular transmuscular approach involves the injection of the local anesthetic in the plane between quadratus lumborum and the psoas major and catheter can also be inserted for continuous infusion so as we see here uh, this is the anatomy anteriorly the laterally we can see the three bands of the muscles transverse abdominis internal oblique and external oblique and the posteriorly we have the latissimus and the quadratus lumborum and the psoas major so the nerves the lateral the spinal nerves which emerge from the vertebral body and it traverses laterally and along the tap plane and it pierces the pierces anterior shape so if we see if we give the block there are three approaches again depending upon the position of the or the relation to the quadratus lumborum we have anterior lateral or the posterior anterior block is given between the psoas major and the quadratus lumborum lateral it is given uh, it is almost like a tab block which is given lateral to the quadratus lumborum which is spreads to the tab block and the posterior is the between posterior to the quadratus lumborum that is between the latissimus dorsi and the quadratus lumborum so the it anesthetizes the lateral cutaneous branches of all the ilio hypogastric t12 to l1 the anterior ql block has a more consistent mid to lower thoracic spread it is a most commonly uh, used and because there is a wide spread of the anesthesia with the anterior ql block and the posterior block has more spread of the ilio to the lateral and the posterior abdominal wall and the ql block provides somatic as well as a visceral analgesia so the requirement for the uh, systemic analgesia is also less with the quadratus lumbar block <clears throat> so if you see it is a flag sign uh, uh, sign where in the quadratus lumborum if you see it is like a flag and the stem is a transverse process so we are piercing through the erector spinae piercing through the quadratus lumborum and it is separating the quadratus lumborum from the psoas psoas is pushed down and in between this plane we give the block wherein psoas is pushed down now there are many studies like occasion colleagues in 50 pediatric patients who have done a study undergoing elective unilateral inguinal hernia repair or the orchidopexy found that ql blocks provided superior and longer post operative analgesia than tab blocks now a comparison of ql blocks and ilih blocks in pediatric patients undergoing open inguinal hernia of the pesamerchuria found that ql blocks provided a superior pain control and there is also number of other studies like in a pilot study by axu and there are 10 patients who received anterior ql blocks for inguinal hernia were pain free for 48 hours after the surgery there was also a cadaveric study conducted by el sharki and coworkers to evaluate the spread of the dye in the anterior and the posterior ql blocks they found that anterior ql block has a more consistent mid to lower thoracic spread while the posterior block has a spread towards the lateral and the posterior abdominal wall with a limited cephalic spread then erector spinae block 
it is a group of muscles that include the iliocostalis longalis and spinalis muscles these muscles run from almost the skull to the pelvis in the sacral region and from the spinous medially they are attached to the spinous lamina to the transverse processes, processes extending to the ribs now this muscle group is encased in a retinaculum that extends from the skull to the sacrum the craniocaudal spread of the local anesthetic is very much high though it may look simple uh, like a band of the muscle but the structure is little complicated there are the fascia which is extends and there are many compartments which are there which have a um, unpredictable spread of the local anesthetic as well there is a dorsal and ventral ramae of the t2 t12 spinal nerves thoracic and abdominal surgeries like nephrectomies and video assisted thoracoscopic surgeries splenectomies and other laparotomies can also be done there is a retrospective randomized trial conducted by holland and co-workers in 164 children who underwent various thoracic and abdominal surgeries including cardiac surgery found that erector spinal block provided good post operative block now if we see there is the, though this band of the uh, muscles is not very clearly seen in pediatric there is this band which is a more superficial is a trapezius rhomboid than erector spinae so what we do we pierce through the patient being in a lateral position and uh, the needle is passed through the muscles and uh, touching the transverse process wherein we are lifting the erector spinae it is exactly uh, look, uh, injected beneath the erector spinae fascia so here it is uh, i found this video uh, really uh, to, to demarcate between the transverse process as well as the uh, ribs if it is in the upper thorax we need to look at the horizontal horizontal uh, the size of the vertebra you can see it is more of horizontal now if we see the um, needle it is traversing and it is hitting the transverse process just above the transverse process uh, the injection they have given the injection and we see the separation the lifting up of the erector spinae muscle now ilio inguinal and ilio hypogastric nerve block usually for the surgeries in the inguinal regions or keratopexis or hydrocelectomies or inguinal any other inguinal region surgeries the complications it is relatively safe but the uh, as we said for any other block the perforation of the bowel wall is very much uh, uh, alarming and there is a infection chances intravascular injections local anesthetic toxicity bowel punctures pelvic hematomas and femoral nerve palsy is also uh there are some cases reported cases femoral nerve block may occur in up to 11% of the cases so more or less you are overstepping the time please try to complete yes complete. yes so again we see uh yes so we are injecting the drug the ilioinguinal and ilio hypogastric they originate from t12 and they extend to l1 and uh, which are the nerve roots of the lumbar plexus these nerves pierce the internal oblique aponeurosis 2 to 3 cm medial to the anterior superior leg spine the ilioinguinal nerve travels between the internal oblique and external oblique aponeurosis here it accompanies the spermatic cord and is part of the neurovascular bundle to the genital area so here we can see the ilio hypogastric and ilioinguinal now ilioinguinal is um, and they they uh, they supply the structures below umbilicus ultrasound guided technique again the probe is placed on the line from the anterior superior leg spine to the umbilicus with the lateral end of the probe resting on the bone here we can see between the internal oblique and the transverse anterior superior iliac spine is a shadow and we are giving the near to the anterior superior iliac spine that is more lateral there are many studies which has successful use of the ultrasound guided ilih block in six premature babies who underwent inguinal hernia repair under ga and none of the patients required opioids in the perioperative block but they used the volume as minimal as 0.17 ml per kg 
as compared to 0.25 ml per kg in the landmark based technique. The cautions we need to keep in the local anesthetic toxicity and the target tissue planes are very much vascular and the blocks require a high volume of local anesthetic agent to ensure adequate spread in the fascia planes. Though it is said that uh, it is very vascular, still when compared to the landmark, uh, landmark techniques has a less uh, chances of the toxicity because uh, we say that uh, we are injecting and there is a no proper fascia we are not giving in a proper fascia which is visible clearly visible so the drug spread is which is very varied and uh, it that will not cause it much of local anesthetic toxicity the potential for high plasma concentration is further increased by the high cardiac output and local blood flow in children rather than adults. Strict attention to the dosing guidelines, use of dilute local and strict solutions to achieve required volumes and addition of epinephrine to limit systemic absorption. Use of less cardiotoxic local and stick agents and monitoring of the patients for 30 to 45 at least after the block to allow achievement of peak plasma concentration. That the trunkal blocks and to conclude, have evolved in recent years and in combination with other analgesics can be used as a main component of multimodal post-operative analgesia. A skilled anesthesiologist with appropriate caution, these blocks can provide effective pain relief in pediatric patients undergoing surgery with fewer complications. It improves post-operative experience for both children as well as the parents. And it has a greater array for peripheral blocks to be safer. Technology is important, but it is not a replacement for a solid understanding of anatomy and a high standard of general safe practice. Further research is needed to evaluate the efficacy and safety. This is the difference. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Shweta. Now, I, uh, without uh, taking much time, I would like to introduce our next speaker for today. Doctor, are you going to ask for the questionnaire at the end of all sessions or uh, because Sir, uh, uh, I think uh, we can take up if there are any questions pertaining to Shweta right now. Yeah, yeah. And, and then, then yeah, we can rest, we can take up at the end. Yeah, even to the team, there are quite a few. So we can take it up right now also. Yeah. Dr. Nitin, uh, for you, there's something, if you, for you, this number one from Dr. Shaura of Sankar who has asked about uh, regarding the ventilator settings. I think the same question has been asked uh, again by Dr. Siddha, uh, Siddhartha as well. They expect you to elaborate on the ventilator setting. I, although you touched on that briefly when you discussed, uh, could you elaborate them sure, sure, uh, clearly so that what they should do? Uh, as we talked about, uh, basically you have to define whether you want to go for a volume control setting or a pressure control mode in your setup. Uh, it is advised, basically the studies say that the pressure control mode is better in a pediatric subset. So what we use, I can tell you that we go for a pressure control mode in our patients and you need to basically target the minute ventilation. So depending upon the weight of the patient, depending upon the requirement, the end title that you want to target, you may go ahead with the uh, ventilatory parameters. Uh, go for a big, low tidal volume because you want to go for a, uh, the rate has to be increased in these patients so as to achieve a good end tidal work, end tidal, end tidal carbon dioxide for these patients. And an administration of PEEP. So maybe if you're having a neonate or an infant or uh, in that case, you can go for a PEEP of three. And if you have an older uh, pediatric patients, in that case, you can go for a PEEP of five or six, depending upon the requirement of the patient. Uh, the other thing would be uh, your uh, IE ratio. Now, in case you're still not able to attain, for example, you have increased the respiratory rate, you have increased, uh, you have uh, set the maximum uh, uh, total volume that you can for a particular weight of the patient. In that case, you can go for an IE ratio. You can increase the uh, expiratory time that it might help you to attain a, uh, an entire carbon dioxide within the permissible range. So this is uh, yeah. for the ventilator. As uh, Dr. Nitin mentioned, uh, to, men to elaborate on that a little bit, primarily you try to use uh, PCV as your primary mode in pediatrics uh, uh, in uh, order to achieve an adequate tidal volume. What happens most of the time, the tidal volume may not be achieved adequately enough. So adjust your uh, uh, pressure so that you attain a reasonable tidal volume and the minute ventilation adequate enough to achieve an adequate CO2 washout. That will be your endpoint in uh, your ventilatory setting. 
you play around with your uh, pressures so that uh, other problem which should crop up as well if in smaller children undergoing laparoscopic surgery the tube size itself may prevent you from uh, uh, showing a very high airway pressures initially uh, in spite of pressures and everything would might be slightly higher but do not uh, worry too much about it as long as you are able to wash out adequately enough by playing around with the peep and your uh, pressure support you should be all right to ventilate the child with the planned uh, ventilator and there was another question uh, dr nitin for the use of lma yes, briefly you touched on that yeah we, we will uh, lma uh, they have been lot of studies people have used lma for uh, pediatric laparoscopic surgeries uh, even in past i have used uh, lmas for pediatric surgeries and uh, uh i think it is basically your own practice what what are you uh, i mean if you feel that the patient for example if it is um, uh the patient is not obese the airway pressures are fine and uh, the patient is not at a significant increase of uh, aspiration maybe because of uh, underlying disease that the patient has maybe so in those patients you can very well go in for an lma but what i would say is you have to go for a second generation do not go for first generation that is a totally uh, a contraindication to the use you can go in for supraglottics from the second generation and uh, make sure that you see your oropharyngeal leak pressures they are very important what people do is people place in a supraglottic but they don't really check they just see okay fine there is no leak and that's all that's the end of the story no that is not the end of the story because you have to see the oropharyngeal leak pressures because they are basically the safety guards for you so if your oropharyngeal leak pressures are very well maintained both before the pneumoperitoneum and after creation of pneumoperitoneum sometimes you tend to check it once you have placed the supraglottic and you do not check it once the pneumoperitoneum has been created and that is when that is where you go wrong so if you are going for a supraglottic ensure that the oropharyngeal leak pressures are well within the range it should be above the uh inspiratory the peak inspiratory pressures that the patient has achieved so if your uh, peak inspiratory pressures are below the oropharyngeal leak pressures you are still safe the airway is safe and uh, the risk of aspiration will be is, is very minimalistic all the uh, uh, the studies they have uh, said so far that they did not find any significant uh, risk of aspiration with the use of supraglottic airway devices so you can use but then these are the cautions that you have to take once you are using it so yeah. uh, and uh, risk said, uh, Dr. Nathan, yeah primarily i would advise for uh, people who are starting to use a uh, supraglottic device for a laparoscopic surgery rule of thumb my rule of thumb i would stick to any child requiring size 2 and 1/2 and above you may be better off you may be safer and any size less than 2 which means the child itself is small enough to take a smaller lma and the chances of dislodgement chances of uh, you having a problem during the surgery is going to be very high so uh, try to use it on a little bit older children will be all right but very small children ideally you go for a, a, a control the endotracheal intubation uh, sequence that will be fine and uh, yeah, yeah, for a neonate i would say go for a tube for a neonate absolutely so neonate, for a neonate yeah. and infants i would say in those patients try and go for a tube i would prefer that with yes. my osteoprogloty and uh, dr siddharth has asked uh, for uh, one question to dr shweta can qr block be as a sole anesthetic technique in cooperative children uh, with multiple comorbidities which surgeries do you think they will take that yeah there are some studies where the emergencies uh, especially in the emergency surgeries where the patient is cooperative and multi uh, patient has many uh, comorbidities or uh, they have uh, underwent the surgery under sole quadratus lumborum but usually if the patient does not uh, have any comorbidities i we don't prefer this as a sole anesthetic purpose it is better used as a multimodal analgesia because yeah, it is not yes the so, definition for cooperative child is very very uh, Yeah, uh, uh, I would subjective. say subjective, uh, highly subjective, and uh, it's very difficult to define. So, uh, as you said very clearly, it is uh, part of the multimodal analgesia technique for the child, and to use fuel as alone as a standalone in children is still a long way to go, and may not be suitable under the given circumstances. I think uh, another small uh, 
addition would be you know epinephrine was used for the blocks but a lot of adjuvants are used to prolong analgesia so small word anything dexmedetomidine uh, dexamethasone a lot of them have been used so that should also be appropriately included uh, so that the block is uh, much more effective uh, for long duration of surgery so post operative and uh, for lap and especially you know for laparoscopic or eras protocols now with suvamidex uh, word of caution for those listening uh, it is not indicated for patients less than 2 years so please bear that in mind thank you sir no no for the questions i think you go on any other questions uh, i think there was one think, small uh, question about uh, a large asd or pleopexy coming for lap or cleopexy what is to be done first I think all your description of pathophysiology yeah, yeah, yeah. dr nitin as i mean it's safer to do the large asd first and then because you know you have a risk of uh, right to left shunting with embolus traveling to the uh, other parts of the nervous system so always the uh, asd if it's a large asd that's the first one that should be done and practically one thing i think dr nitin also mentioned uh, there a lot of children they will come with a vp shunt and the vp shunt in place and then they come for the minor appendicitis and things like that the surgeon will be very enthusiastic to do a laparoscopic uh, a quick in and out uh, you be very cautious it's a relative contraindication unless you are very well experienced it, it you will as a private practitioner you will see it a lot for children coming in with uh, vp shunts who are some minor abdominal procedures so be very cautious on that and uh, trendlenburg is truly not trendlenburg the table doesn't really tell you how much of trendlenburg the child is because the adults it will be easy to predict the trendlenburg uh, will be about some day four or five feet up and above you will be able to predict but especially in a smaller children the trendlenburg is very very uh, dangerous and you got to make sure you keep a sandbag on the head of the table and then tip Uh, stick it to the table so that the child doesn't slip and fall off. Uh, it's quite uh, happened in few centers. So be cautious. Some of the practical points for the uh, lab uh, procedure in very small children. Be very cautious. Don't believe the table Trendelenburg to be reflecting what is happening inside the drapes. So be very cautious on that. So I think uh, especially with uh, hypercapnia, even though you titrate and ventilatory settings are optimized. it might sometimes be for required to tolerate a little bit of uh, you know hypercapnia and finish the procedure rather than aim to because any of those further adjustments would compromise on the cardiac output i think shall we go in for the next talk please i think so sir I yes think, i think yeah. uh, dr anju wants to say something uh very good evening to all of you uh, thank you uh, for the excellent initiative navin sir uh, both the speakers uh, did excellent job with their lectures uh, dr nitin and dr shweta the talks were very elaborative and comprehensive uh, just a small comment about the titrated peep uh, in laparoscopic surgeries in adults there is a lot of literature upcoming regarding the prevention of atelectasis in the post operative period with the use of titrated peep instead of the fixed peep and with the titrated peep uh, you will be surprised to know that uh, uh, the peep levels are kept up to and above 10 uh, mm mercury instead of the usual 3 to 5 and it has been seen to prevent the atelectasis uh, to a larger extent as compared to the fixed peep of 5 so even we have a study ongoing in our department where we are comparing fixed peep with the titrated peep and uh, till now what i have seen is that the incidence of increased uh, you know uh, the uh, b lines which we see post operatively to uh, know the atelectasis the incidence is much less with the use of titrated peep the peep is titrated as per the abdominal pressures uh, timely and abg values are also much better thank you very much thank you ma'am thank you and uh, yeah. finally we have got dr asit vesna Uh, for a comment, Doctor Asit Vesna, please. Yes, uh, mo most of the tertiary care centers uh, have built-in AG monitors in their systems, uh, which provide side-stream uh, capnography monitoring. It is CO2. So I would recommend for neonatal and small children 
to have dedicated cap uh, mainstream capnograph, uh, particularly for uh, doing laparoscopic surgeries. In just before a few days, I came across a center using side stream capnography uh, in a uh, capnothorax, particularly uh, uh, thoracoscopic surgery, uh, and and they were, they have been using. They were surprised, or they were questioning why we are we are getting uh, this low PCO2 readings. They think it was obvious, very much obvious that they they were using side stream technology uh, of uh, their AG monitors. So I would recommend uh, a dedicated mainstream capnograph for pediatric laparoscopic surgeries. Thank you, sir. Thank, Thank you, you for sir. those valuable inputs. Yeah. Over to you, Monica. Now, I, I would like to go ahead with our uh, session, and I would like to invite our next speaker, Dr. Shreya Garwal. She's consultant in HCG, uh, Rachi, and her major achievements are A.K. Gupta Young Anesthesiologist Award 2022, and her areas of interest is our difficult airway, thoracic anesthesia, oncoanesthesia, acute and chronic pain management. So, Dr. Shreya, welcome, and uh, you can please start your talk now. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Good evening, everyone. Dr. Nitin and Dr. Shweta with their informative and comprehensive lectures have provided us with in-depth knowledge and taught us how to incorporate this into practice. But for now, let us take a step back and focus on attitude. Let us talk about the trials, tribulations, and enriching experiences of our branch anesthesia at large. I have been given a very interesting topic. It is titled New Girl in the City. So let me start by telling you a bit about myself. I'm Dr. Shreya Agarwal. I was a hardcore Mumbai car. I've done my schooling, my college from Mumbai, MBBS from JJ Hospital in Mumbai, DNB from Hinduja Hospital in Bombay, and for 29 years of my life, I was in Bombay, after which I think two major tragedies befell me. One was the COVID-19 pandemic, and the second was me getting married. And a weird combination of the two led me to travel from the south of Bombay to the south of Bihar, which is now Jharkhand's capital city, Ranchi. So for a Mumbaikar, Delhi is unsafe, and the rest of India is basically a gown. So this is how I imagined the roads to be. Also, OTT platforms didn't help as shows like Jamtara and Gangs of Vasepur taught me that crime is galore in Jharkhand. Also, my friends joked that the only two things your city is going to be famous for is one, this legendary man, Mahendra Singh Dhoni, and the second is the Central Institute of Psychiatry or the Kanke Mental Hospital. Anyway, Yorin began a life and a career in a completely new part of India a completely new culture, a very different mindset, new languages, no friends, and no other medicos in the family to guide me through. I found a job as an associate consultant at the HCG chain of cancer hospitals, which is a corporate hospital in Charkhand. And by sheer luck, this job also gave me both time and freedom to pursue private practice that is freelancing as well. And thus began numerous challenges that come with freelancing in tier two cities. Let us explore them one by one. Let us focus on resource-centric challenges. Lack of proper equipment. Where I did my DNB at Hinduja Hospital, we had a workstation in every OT, proper equipment in every OT. In fact, I remember for the DNB exams when asked, when we were studying equipment and we were asked to describe boils, our seniors told us, no, you're not going to see boils anywhere. You're not going to be asked about boils. Don't bother about boils. And when we went to a government hospital, we actually went to their museum where all the storehouse and we saw boils for the first time there. And imagine my surprise where the first case that I go for a freelance in Ranchi is a boils with a halothane vaporizer that I really don't know how to use. With laryngoscopes, bougies, your airway equipments, everything else, the same problem remains. It's a low resource setting. Your essential drugs are not available, and the train power to train manpower to hand them to you is also not available. This was two days ago when I was giving a case, and the patient was an undiagnosed hypertensive. Intra-op, the PP was around 170 by 100, 
And I asked for any beta blockers that they might have because I could not spot esmolol or labitalol right there. And the technician comes to me, gives me a bottle of noradrenaline and says, this is cheaper. Esmolol costs around 230 rupees. This one costs just 40. Please use this, madam. There is lack of ICU. There's lack of ventilators. Even big setups and corporates here do not have a dedicated ICU or spare ventilators. And many hospitals do not have 24 by 7 intensivist coverage. Lack of protocols is a problem. And additional help. This is the point that I really need to emphasize on. Mostly in freelancing or even in the corporate hospital that I work at, they are run by one anesthetist at a time. Which means if I am present at a nursing home or in an OT, there's no other anesthetist available in the vicinity to help me if required. Now coming to surgeon-centric problems. This would also be center-centric problems because in tier two cities, in most places, your centers are run, your nursing homes and small hospitals are run by surgeons themselves, are surgeon owned. So the first problem that I have faced is dictating type of anesthesia. Surgeons advise us to give laparoscopic spinals for laparoscopic surgeries and blocks without the necessary equipment like USG or a peripheral nerve stimulator. There's lack of respect for our field. So when I go for a cesarean section and I want to see the investigations uh, pre-op, pre the surgeon says, Are nahi, I've been doing this for six years. These patients are all fine. Don't bother. Just don't waste my time. Just give the spinal right now. Employing unskilled manpower. This is something that I have witnessed here in a tier two city. I don't know if this was prevalent in Bombay as well, but uh, there are technicians and there are surgeons themselves who go and give spinal and they charge let's say 20% of what we charge. And that is how even hospitals don't mind. And this, I think, is disrespectful to anesthetists and also is highly unsafe for the patients. Consent investigations and documentation are a problem. Consent is never written. If it's written, it's not informed. It's definitely not informed. And proper documentation is not the norm. PAC on the day of surgery. A sur when I mentioned this to a leading surgeon, she said pre-anesthetic checkup is still a pre-anesthetic checkup if it's five minutes before the surgery, right? And that is when I realized this term is misleading. So I've started using this term called uh, add back, which is at least a day before anesthetic surgery. It sounds silly, but it has served its purpose. And now the technicians and the surgeons know that this is the way to go. At least a day before anesthesia, a pre-anesthetic checkup is required. Another important point that I would like to highlight is the lack of safety of OT personnel as such also. Hospitals where I visit for freelancing, even with a roaring orthopedic practice, have no protocols for lead gowns and lead aprons for uh, when CRM is concerned. So uh, I gave a spinal anesthesia in this particular case. I asked for a lead apron. This sister runs two stories above and gets a neatly folded, four-folded lead apron and hands it to me, you're not supposed to fold a lead apron. And then I did uh, a study. And then I saw online that there was a study conducted uh, in 2018. And we found this, this was done in uh, a sample size of 524 surgeons. And they found that 13% were extremely concerned about radiation exposure, 31% very, and well, the rest. If you think these statistics are low, you will be surprised at the internal study that I did. This is my sample. My sample size was 20. And this is the study that I did where I found 80% of the people do not know what a lead apron is. The orthopedic surgeons know and when asked says that he has completed his family. So he doesn't require a lead gum. So 10% like me and other anesthetists say very. And the remaining 10%, which includes the technician at that place, says he Mumbai wali madam ke nai chochle hai. Coming to anesthesiologist related problems, surgeon pleasing tactics is the main. When I go for a spinal and I ask for investigations uh, like a basic blood count, your platelet levels, INR, or your bleeding time, clotting time, these people, uh, the technicians inform me that, okay, this anesthetist does it without it. So then next time we are not called. But these unsafe practices also lead to loss of dignity and respect because we are seen to be snobbish or somebody who's uptight, who wants a lot of investigations for a particular case, ill talks by our own colleagues. All these are problems, I think, by and large, everywhere, but in a tier two city where you lack resources, these unsafe practices are really 
uh, unsafe. There's a silver, silver lining to this cloud as well. This is the another incident that happened uh, when I had induced a case already. And uh, this was a laparoscopic surgery. After inducing the case, the surgeon realizes that there is no CO2 cylinder. There's no CO2 cylinder in the OT. So we had to, of course, abandon the case and uh, reverse the patient. Uh, so now what I've begun doing is also triple checking the surgeon's equipments in this city. So I've this has led to a very keen attention to detail and I have truly become Jill of all trades. Anyway, a year down the line, I would like to uh, talk about the tips and tricks that people could uh, learn. Learn to The first and foremost is learning to say no. Choosing your surgeon, choosing your institute, choosing your timings, everything else. So if you learn to say no, if you prioritize, you might get less cases initially, but good work always goes recognized. Always practice safe anesthesia practices. There are numerous forms and uh, the WHO uh, forms for surgery and for pre-anesthesia are, um, are mandatory. I keep them in my mind and that is how it has helped me avoid a lot of problems before freelancing anywhere. Prioritizing my timings, balancing uh, family life with, uh, with work and prioritizing timings, whether you want to do night shifts and everything else. To learn, unlearn and relearn is very important. There are many forums like the Global Anesthesia Society on Facebook and the CAP series that we have ongoing now and uh, the BSA forums or the ISA forums online are uh, really important to keep yourself updated. It is really important to unlearn your practices and relearn them. Planning, communication and execution, especially for beginners, I've begun keeping my own kit with my own LMAs and my own Buji and my own laryngoscope as well especially for pediatric patients. And I think this has helped me gain confidence in a scenario where uh, it were, otherwise things would have gone really haywire. Professional indemnity is another thing that I will really recommend uh, everyone, every freelancer to have. And uh, because people are becoming more and more aware and even in tier two cities. Lastly, I would also want to add something here is Never start a case on an empty stomach. This is something I had read a few weeks ago, again, on Global Anesthesia Society Forum. And it made a lot of sense. Uh, this I'm saying from personal experience. The patient's stomach should be empty. Yours should not be. Now, in terms of the whole work experience in a tier two city, not all is held in paradise. There are several important things that I have come to appreciate. And I would like to give them the due justice they deserve by mentioning them here. The people of Jharkhand and many, if not most, tier two cities are friendly and largely accepting of outsiders. They treat doctors with utmost respect. And I cannot begin to tell you how good it feels when I'm, you know, when I'm greeted by the OT staff, when I go to the OT and everyone with a big grin says good morning. And that is my start of the day. And I just cannot take such respect and regard so early on in my career for granted. Doctor-patient relationships in tier two cities are also a little less professional. This translates to better interpersonal relationships and patients often remember and even help their doctors later on in life. Also, in such cities, the demand supply gap is in our favor. Compared to metros, this leads to better job opportunities and better remuneration. Your work is recognized, respected and appreciated much earlier and the growth curve is steeper and faster compared to big cities. Also, having worked at places like Hinduja or JJ Hospital, I was a little worried about my academics and research going for a toss year. I thought, kya hi naya itna seekhenge? But on my very first month here at Ranchi, I learned something very new. I had gone somewhere and this was a case under spinal. Clear, free flow of CSF and I give the drug and it does not act. Nothing. The patient has free leg movements. The drug has not acted at all. I repeat the drug and still the same thing. This is when a meek looking technician goes to this uh, patient and whispers four magic words. This made me realize 
that and then i read online and there were very few research papers and articles on this but this made me realize a very important thing that the scorpion venom is known to affect the pumping mechanisms of sodium channels in the nerve fibers and it may be responsible for the development of resistance to the action of local anesthetic agents it made me realize that knowledge is everywhere as long as we are willing to learn with this in mind and a lot of team effort our team took a big brave step and in jan 23 we successfully completed the first hypex surgery of dharkan this is my team at hcg cancer hospital and this is when i think everything fell into place and this new girl in the city felt at home so i would like to end by saying to ha dharkan which is welcome to dharkan and if any of you are ever in ranchi please contact me i would love to connect and a big thank you to our cap moderator dr navin sir our chair persons and our chief coordinators our uber coordinators and especially dr nishan sahai for giving me this platform thank you sir wonderful dr shreya i been you i think uh, you you have been a model and sociologist who has trans transitioned from mumbai to jharkhand and and have so bravely sort of you know managed and uh, such a positive attitude i think that's what keeps you going and you have rightly pointed out all the tips and tricks that have happened i mean i can relate this to about 40 years 35 years ago in in Hy- in a place like hyderabad i'm not even talking about jharkhand yes sir everything that you have mentioned happened here too till till somebody amongst the private practitioners formed a group and decided we are all together which i think all of you should do too yes sir and because it's very important like you rightly said lack of help professional help and just get on to a whatsapp group create a small whatsapp group of social media can be beautiful to help you out in a crisis so you are just a phone call away or a friend is phone call away for you to help each other which is a thing i would definitely suggest and keeping your own kit is is the safest thing that you could probably do little investment right now can go a long way in helping you to you know bail you out in tough situations and always always take your surgeon and uh, patient into confidence and because we did talk about when to say no that's the first thing is uh, you have to learn and when you're doing as a private practitioner that is very enlightening thank you for sharing your uh, you know all your uh, thoughts with us thank you thank you sir Akshaya, I think uh, very appropriately put in. Uh, your attitude really uh, matters to succeed in private practice. There's no doubt about that. And after seeing two different countries, three countries, I would say, uh, outside India doing private practice, I have been involved in. I think the story is the same everywhere. It doesn't change. Uh, it's uh, surgeon centric. The system helps in these places outside uh, the country. System in the sense the Uh, academic body, uh, say something like your associations, societies, and the government bodies, they put in stringent guidelines for all the private uh, hospitals to have minimum uh, standards. Even in India, it is there. It is there. ISA has given very clear guidelines for minimum standards of monitoring, minimum equipments, minimum things required. But the only thing is, there is no. The cycle is not complete. because they don't go in authorized to go in for a periodic checkup and then license the center or the hospital whether they are capable of taking certain cases to be done in that place that's that's very important the country uh, outside uh, india they have the system that they have uh, very clearly uh, the government systems or the associations the uh, education bodies they have authority to visit and they should be licensed to uh, allow them to carry out surgical work with the necessary uh, standard of monitoring and the standard of care and standard of type of procedures they could do that's the main difference i think in india it should come up i have been saying in my city also that we should form the a group that they will visit each and every hospital in the year of a particular time fixed by the hospital and the association or the government bodies so that i've been even advising the government advises the healthcare systems you consider this option that every year the hospitals should be licensed to practice is something like the hospital 
the individuals to license to practice the hospital also should have the license to provide the care so that your problems of equipment and everything will be removed i think that will come up as the time and right people taking up at the right time i think that's my comment thank you dr shreya this is dr meenal here and um, first and foremost dr navin and the entire team thank you the cap series is a wonderful wonderful series and as you were an anesthesiologist it is giving us a platform to speak our minds out and also to present very pertinent topic now this particular topic shreya which you have spoken so i remember isa itself there is a session in isa in the 2000 uh, um 19 bangalore i say you know they had put a session here where they asked us to speak about problems faced by young freelancing anesthesiologists so this particular uh, thing you know i had covered there and this is a topic very close to my heart i'll tell you why because i am married to an army officer and for the last 14 years i have been moving every two years i i i move from one city to the other and it becomes extremely difficult so every time i'm a new girl in the city now transitioning into a new woman in the city you know slowly so so now i keep telling my husband it's so difficult so there are three things which i will let you know here which um, i hope the youngsters can take away this message <clears throat> first and foremost whenever you are practicing in a new city it's very important you go and meet the entire team of anesthesiologists who are all, already there all the seniors who are there because no matter whatever said and done you might think you have a lot of knowledge but you cannot beat their experience but we don't know how to work with halothin i still don't work with halothin okay and second thing is that uh, let them understand that you are not a competition for them let them understand that that sir please give us cases whenever you are not doing them please let us call us when you are on leave and at, in the beginning you're going to get night calls and slowly only you might make your place in good centers third thing i would like to say is that all these uh, you know platforms which have been given to us by isa and there are other bodies also but more so i would uh, talk about isa here like for example sir has recently made a cap group on whatsapp and we are able to discuss so many things on the group little little things people are discussing about what's the amount of drug dosage etc etc so we must come up and talk about it and talk about our problems problems are going to be there it's not going to go away even after making stringent guidelines this and that and we have to learn to work with them like i'll tell you how i decided to work with because there was no per peripheral nerve stimulator and usg guided block i learned how to give um, uh, the landmark guided blocks so i am doing a lot of landmark guiding then slowly i bought my own peripheral nerve stimulator you have to keep updating yourself so thank you and thank you for a wonderful presentation thank you sir thank you ma'am Dr. Shreya, this was an. Can I can I speak a few words? Yes, absolutely, sir. Thank you, sir. This was an excellent talk. It is Thank not you. only a new young girl in the town. It is it is the same story for a retired person when he comes to the town in the private practice. I have superannuated more than a decade back. and i can feel myself in your shoes when you started talking about the lecture i had also it is not only the even i had to face so many problems but there is only one thing which can help you to overcome these obstacles is that manage to have a scientific group meeting once a month where you and your colleagues of anesthesiology talk your problems discuss it and try to solve them in between it would be always nice that all the surgeons who do not fall in line to have the minimum standard monitoring requirement and other things or other equipments like they still feel that if they have a boys apparatus they are very safe call them in these group meetings and discuss about it there that what is the difference between the old gadgets old equipment old drugs and the present one awareness is a big support and awareness is a big guide 
make the surgeons to be aware of the new developments and the awareness about the safety protocols the time will be a positive thing to help you to achieve your target your talk was very interesting and a real real story thank you god bless you thank you thank you sir thank you so much sir i thank my uh, esteemed chairpersons for guiding us throughout the session and moving on to the next speaker i would like to invite dr somya bindra she is senior resident in himalayan institute of medical sciences and her achievements are best thesis award at institutional level her areas of interest include oncology anesthesia pain and palliative medicine dr somya you would like to hear from you now we can please start the session please unmute yourself yes ma'am thank you so much for the question Um, good evening, everyone, and thank you to all the esteemed seniors for this opportunity. With great honor and privilege, I would like to recount my experience as a senior resident on my first ever emergency night duty. My residency, though an amalgamation of a lot of teachable moments, can be easily summed up by the phrase "this too shall pass." but you know the complete phrase goes that this too shall pass however it might just pass like a kidney stone and it did 3 years of post graduation left behind a young okay not such a young woman but one who firmly believed that the chaos in her mind should never reflect on her face with that thought it was finally time to step onto the field armed with all this exhaustive knowledge to command a ship a ship that's enormous and probably on fire and that you must sail you've been trained to give general anesthesia spinal anesthesia nerve blocks and to distract young children and bring some new ones into the world and your version of how's the josh is quite replaced by how's the you trying to tone ma'am I started my first ever night duty as a senior resident and with brutal honesty I can admit that if I looked at my consultant like a lost lamb the same way three junior residents were looking at me waiting for my next move then I should strive to mentor them the same way that I have been mentored in an overwhelmed state I turned to my consultant panic evident in my voice and I asked what do I do and she said you you take over from here so i did you know we finished our lectures with the day within 2 hours of call so far so good i say we because anesthesia is pure team work there's no lone soldier who hasn't called for help it's sink or swim and you have to learn how to swim because otherwise a ton of patients could sink with you all of which i found perversely exhilarating it's hard work the hours sometimes seem inhumane and i have seen things that have scarred my memory but there was no turning back now our first emergency case was a cesarean section i had a fellow obgyn rant of the indication npo status the investigations vitals and these pieces of a puzzle just seemed to fall into place to reveal that we had a multi gravida in labor with breech presentation the dilemma here however was not about how many iv cannula to secure because we've all been taught that right two large bore iv cannula always but it was whether to take on this case and administer the subarachnoid block myself or to trust a junior resident with the task you see we'd been trained to run ot's and to understand what a senior consultant or the case might require from us but i had rarely been in a position to delegate so after deliberation with a 
sense of concentration that could probably have solved the issue of world hunger, I decided to hand over the task to my junior resident. A quick look at the NST and the fetal heart rate reassured me that we had some time on our hands. And so the JR2 promptly got scrubbed. But time seemed to stop completely. Thank heavens that they decided to use a 25 gauge spinal needle because had the flow of CSF been any slower, I believe I would have needed some supplemental oxygen myself from the breath I was holding and the laryngoscope plate I clutched so fiercely behind my back. So the newborn's first cry was accompanied by a quick phone call to inform about another incoming cesarean section. This time, a young, anxious primary gravita with non-progress of labor. A wide-eyed 22-year-old, and my heart went out to her. Sinus tachycardia with a rate of 126 beats per minute soon confirmed her anxious state. But just, just for a minute, that would have easily been my heart rate as well. But now, the, uh, the residents were also well aware of the need to be quick yet efficient and Hustling between all these OTs was a challenge that I had to adapt and keep up with. By the time our third cesarean came uh, into the OR, I'm really not sure whose cry was louder, the newborns or the first year residents who was dying of hunger. Hunger apparently has no age limit, this I have discovered. So there I was running between OAS to induce leptotomies for a burst appendix and assist an ankle block for grade two amputation and also to watch out for surgeons who wanted to put some elective lists to avoid a long runtime the next day. Time flew, it passed, and with every hour, my actions became more confident. Never over, always cautious. Our next pause came when a case of obstructive hydrocephalus in a young one came my way. A pediatric patient with a large head circumference and an anticipated difficult intubation. A quick phone call to my senior consultant and three minutes of calm questioning and then I'll be there later. A case that seemed impossible to take on alone suddenly seemed less daunting. I, however, rushed to our whiteboard in the OR and wrote down the patient's weight. From there on, began my calculation for drug doses, tube sizes, circuit requirements, and each task sequentially became easier. But if there's ever been a time I've muttered a chant and a prayer, it was then. This felt and was a bigger test than facing any external examiner. So exhausted from all these cases and with the adrenaline fast fading, I hit the couch in our duty room only to be jolted awake from my first shut eye to prescribe analgesia and sedation to a patient. I'll tell you though, my powers are greater than I've realized because by the time I actually reached the patient's website, they were fast asleep already. Our next call was a code blue and it should officially be called as an anesthesiologist caffeine tablet because nothing wakes us up faster. With three young residents in tow and our ACLS guidelines blaring like sirens in our head, we rushed to prove the worth of our recently updated AHA certificates. Not everything, unfortunately, has a smooth sail. The patient was a case of esophageal viruses and blood jetted everywhere. But a senior had once told me, bleeding always stops. Bleeding always stops and sometimes for the saddest of reasons. So as I changed from my blood-soaked clothes into a fresh set of scrubs, I understood that there's things that are out of your control and acceptance play a key role. By the time my phone rang next, I tell you I was ready to change my ringtone, but also run my phone through some water. The call was for a 68-year-old who seemed it was who it seemed was halfway through the Grim Reaper's hold. His oxygen saturation was 73%, and I did not even have the spare seconds to run through the steps of a management plan in my head. Action after action just followed on autopilot mode. I didn't even know I possessed. Oxygen on, IV access, laryngoscope with the Macintosh uh, number four blade, endotracheal tube of size 8 and 8.5, blood gases, catheter, and a quick, quick change in the plethysmograph beat informed me of a successful beam and I 
felt like a superwoman. A strange realization that it's the first time I've independently saved a life. You know, everyone on the outside imagines that we roam the hospital and perform routine acts of heroism. But I believe the truth is that although dozens of lives are saved every day, almost always it happens in a much more low-key, team-based strategy, strategized manner. But sometimes, sometimes it is down to one person and that day it was me. So while my call ended on an exhaustive note, I strive to maintain, like a broken record, that 24-hour calls need not be an endurance challenge. I accept all discussion on this part, but a part of me will always wonder if we want the doctor looking after us to be sleep deprived or functioning at subpar mental awareness. However, I take away a lot of lessons, so I consider these to be a double-edged sword, and I'd like to recount some of my lessons though. Number one, you aren't always going to change the course of a patient overnight. Sometimes your job is to simply tide things over. You know, you never assume anything you're told to be 100% correct. The only trust you place is blindly is on your gut instinct and even then verify, always verify. Number three, never be hesitant to call for help. It may not always be your senior, although it's always better to tell them about an acute change than to wonder whether you should disturb them at 3 a.m. But call up your colleagues. Your friends in medicine might just have a better idea about which antihypertensive drug to use and when. Number four, and this is an important one, know where to find coffee always. Fifth, uh, kindness goes a long way. You know, the nursing staff have an independent career of their own which started way before ours did. They're never too big to learn. And similarly, it takes nothing to reassure a patient or hold their hand. While we have roamed every corner and inch of our OR, it might just be their first time there. So they are unaware of all the protocols and it is a new environment for them. Uh, lastly, senior residency is a label and I say that sitting amidst so many learned seniors right now. It is a label just like any other, a milestone achieved, but at the end of the day, aren't we all paving our way towards new learnings? The last three years have ingrained in me a calmness during crisis I didn't know I was capable of. Anesthesia as a branch teaches you the value of time. It teaches you to understand the physiology of each system of our body, a ticking time bomb that only you can diffuse. To have patients say they didn't even realize when the surgery started and when it ended is a feat no less than magic. While we are all at different stages in our career, a silent camaraderie as we march towards a single goal and promote wellness is a wonderful thing to be a part of. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Think, uh, what that tells you is that uh, anesthesiologists are great at multitasking and I'm, uh, you are an example for that. And that starts obviously when you are a resident and I'm sure you'll become a great consultant. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. And we should carry on with the last talk, please. I think, sir, there, there is a, a comment coming up. Uh, Dr. Divya Gupta has raised hand. So, uh... Good evening, sir. Am I audible, sir? Yes, yes, you are audible. Yes, sir. So myself, Dr. Divya Gupta, Professor from the Department of Himalayan Institute, uh, Medical Sciences, Dehradun. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank Naveen, sir, for giving such a platform to all the young anesthesiologists who are going to be future consultants. And as Dr. Soumya Bindra in her talk very well said, senior residency is the bridge between residency, post-graduation and consultancy. And it is 
an experience which we all face and that is the time where we gain the sense of responsibility that we gain the owners to what we do sir so i must say that even i remember my first this uh, this talk of dr samya took me in nostalgia that my first emergency call i got 25 cesareans done and i felt like it it is so very hectic and all but that gives a sense of responsibility and hard work and dedication for our fraternity that what we are doing as a multitasking she has taken up all the points like intubation calls we are running behind and we are are handling each and every department of the institute of the hospital and catering our services so uh, i must congratulate all the speakers as well sir they have rightly talked about each aspect of uh, the uh, anesthesiology in their own way thank you so much sir for giving me the opportunity to speak dr divya over to you dr monika thank you dr somya so moving on to the next talk of the session i would like to invite dr abhijit abhijit is consultant and anesthesiologist in apollo cradle royal hospital new delhi and he is a recipient of isa national young talent award 2022 and isa delhi young uh, anesthesiologist group his area of interest in food difficult airway research method methodology and critical care welcome dr abhijit you can please start your talk thank you ma'am uh i'll just share my slides okay. yeah sure i hope i'm audible and my uh, slide is visible right yes okay so before i begin the last talk of today's uh, session i understand that i'm late and i'm it's almost dinner time but i would be a crime if i don't express my gratitude to dr navil marotra sir for taking anesthesia to new heights in india uh, it's amazing sir thank you so much for being always there for us and thank you for promoting you are uh, talents in, in the field of anesthesia and now coming up with a brilliant Uh, cap academic series thank you so much sir and uh, i would like to congratulate our my fellow speakers for their excellent job thank you so much so uh, on this uh, presentation of advanced airway management in emergency uh, i would like to just graze through how uh, elective scenarios are different than emergency scenarios uh, emergency scenario can happen from a pre hospital setup in an emergency department in a peripheral setup where a code blue has happened or in the, the scenario where we are providing non operating room anesthesia even in uh, and definitely in ors so in emergency situation there is no time for delayed airway assessments often in emergency and peripheral setups i mean peripheral calls in code blue setups code blue calls there is a le less experience operators are there uh, the concept of physiologically difficult airways is undermined we get a lot of patients who, which which have, they have multiple comorbidities uh, cardiac failures and uh, multiple organ and organ failures which makes uh, the situation more messy and at times in emergency there is no scope of waking up the patients and uh, they are often full stomach the more risk of aspiration pneumonitis and uh, one most foremost thing in at times we get patients in, in shock hemodynamically unstable patients uh, with a new operator uh, at times we just focus into the intubation but in an, in such a critical patient if we directly go to the intubation without resuscitating a patient will make the situation more worse uh, and very operative cardiac events uh, very intubation cardiac events uh, is more in those kind of patients at times uh, there is limited limited infrastructure in our eds and peripheral setups and uh, the availability of help is also less so with this uh, my objectives of this talk would be quick air, airway assessment in emergency devising a proper airway management strategy uh, i will look into the i'll take you through the airway plans and algorithms i'll discuss about some scenarios uh, the options we have and equipments that we have presently in our anma mentorium and the practical pros and evidences and i'll definitely talk about some future directions too so uh, we all know about lemon's law for assessing airway difficulty but it is pretty static parameter and at times it doesn't give you give us a dynamic edge but with the advent of focus and ultrasound we have ultrasound uh, in our upper, uh, wallet and uh, so with the help of ultrasound we can Uh, accurately predict uh, the difficult airways but at times uh, there are multiple parameters but some of them has 
a fair sensitivity and specificity. Distance from skin to hide bone is one such, which can be helpful in emergency situation where we don't have any uh, history available. We don't have uh, physical examinations properly. We cannot do. In that time, uh, an, a quick look through the ultrasound may provide us useful information and a difficult error prediction. We all know about such uh, airway guidelines, ASA, Italian, DAS, uh, Canadian. Uh, all of them, they focus on airway plan and strategy. But let me take you through what is the difference between a plan and a strategy. All of these uh, airway guidelines, they have specific plans, A, B, C, and D. So airway plan suggests a single approach uh, for the management of airway, whereas uh, airway strategy is a coordinated logical sequence of plans which aim to achieve good gas exchange and prevention of aspiration. So we always should focus on uh, formulating an airway strategy than rather than just having a sim single airway plan. So this is the most popular DAS uh, algorithm for unanticipated difficult intubation. As you can see, it has four plans and together it makes a strategy. So if we make just one plan, if it play fails, will we end up losing a precious time to save a life? So always make a strategy rather than a single plan. And all these difficult airway guidelines, they focus on supplemental oxygen. Please, why in the haste of doing intubation, uh, I'm sure some of my junior colleagues will be uh, listening to this. At times, this, in the surge of emergency, we forget to put up the oxygen prior to the intubating at, intubation attempts. Please don't forget to put oxygen. Supplemental oxygen starts from pre-oxygenation. I won't go into the details of pre-oxygenation, but I would like to highlight the importance of para-oxygenation. See, in the first picture, if you can see, uh, while doing pre-oxygenation, the nasal prongs are in C2, and the para-oxygenation has already started during the pre-oxygenation. And the second picture, if you can see, while doing uh, laryngoscopy, the nasal uh, cannula is already there, which is providing no desat or uh, para-oxygenation. With the advent of uh, HFNO, uh, it is an excellent modality for apneic oxygenation. It increases the safe apnea times from seven minutes to almost 15 to 20 minutes with use of uh, such HFNO devices. At times, I, I have been speaking that we should not be hasty in, in uh, while doing intubation, but at times uh, we should decide early on intubation, specifically in dynamic situations like penetrating neck trauma. We call it a 3B, bullet, bites, and burns. Uh, in neck trauma, anaphylaxis or angioedema, and where there is thermal or acoustic uh, injuries, at the, these uh, in these situations we should uh, uh, decide to intubate as soon as possible. So coming into some scenarios, we all come across such scenarios like trauma. But again, for uh, uh, doing an emergency airway management, devising a preparation, proper preparation, and a plan is important. So multiple. Uh, Journals have come up, uh, comes up, have came up with a uh, mnemonics. Stopmed is one of the popular ones. So suction tools for intubation, oxygen positioning, monitors, as, uh, availability of help and availability of equipments. Please check whether uh, the ID access is working or not. So at times you might be uh, deciding quickly. You might not be having a trained help. So they might be giving injections, but the ID access is not uh, working. So at times they, they, that might worsen the situation. And please always, always keep your emergency drugs ready and anticipate uh, prob uh, anticipate any emergencies during the intubation. So at times of emergency, I would uh, recommend uh, that there should be two suctions. So this is an approach called salad approach, particularly useful in management of soiled airways, where there is trauma or vomitus or uh, blood is soiling the airway. So as you, as you can see, there is a young word suction which goes uh, by the side of this laryngoscopy blade, which continuously clears away secretions from the field. And then the airway, uh, then an additional suction is available so that the operator can clear out his field of vision from the field of uh, intubation. So there is a li the literary evidence of salad approaches also. It showed that after te teaching the salad approach, it increases the probability of successful intubation in soiled airways and the time to intubation becomes also less. Obese patients also pose a challenge for advanced airway management. For this, proper ramping is important. Proper patient positioning is really important. At times, we don't even know whether the uh, ramping pillow or uh, needed uh, gadgets or some additional seats are available or not in our emergencies or in OTs. But when the emergency situation happens, then we ask for 
these uh, troop elevation pillows or additional ramping uh, materials. But please uh, prepare for emergency and check the availability of such uh, such gadgets and equipments. Not only the positioning of the patient, the positioning of the operator is also important. In peripheral calls where we see non-adjustable beds and the bed height of the beds are quite low. So at that time, stick a stool, sit at the head end, be comfortable first, and then uh, revise your management strategy and go ahead. So the options that we have, obviously, DLs and VLs, the airway adjuncts are really uh, from, they're, they're handy in the time of emergency. Supraglottic devices are our friends, and uh, video endoscopes and bronchoscopes are at times also useful. And last but not the least, front of neck access is a must-have thing. At times, we go for peripheral calls, and we don't have uh, equipments necessary which are there to uh, do a front of neck access. But anytime you might come across a situation, and I'll be uh, there with uh, there are some newer devices like Brain and TriTube. I'll be talking about them in upcoming slides. So in all the laryngoscopy uh, sets, we should have a stubby head or a short handled laryngoscope, specifically useful for obese patients. And McCoy blade should also be available, particularly in EDs and op or operating rooms. Um, uh, coming to video laryngoscopes, they are uh, advantageous. They have they provide improved laryngeal view in patients with limited mouth opening. It gives us faster time to achieve a successful intubation and is definitely a useful uh, teaching and uh, useful tool for teaching and training. But at times we are more focused on achieving a view. But it's, uh, is it necessary to achieve a best view for intubation? At times the best view is not the, not good for intubation. So here in such view, the glottis is at the middle part of your screen of a video laryngoscope. A blade has been pivoted so far towards the glottis that no space, space is available for uh, the insertion of the tube. So I would recommend try to limit the glottis in the upper half of the screen so that you can uh, get some space to maneuver your tube and you can see where, how the tube is being placed. And I, I would like to emphasize on the point that as soon as the tube goes inside the glottis, we try to take out the laryngoscope blade. Please do not do that. At times, we are using stiletted tube. So while taking out the stilet, your tube might come out. So please make sure that even after coming out, uh, while coming, taking out the stillet, you keep your uh, video laryngoscope in place to visualize uh, the tube position. So which video laryngoscope to be used? Uh, the data is so far heterogeneous. There is no clear-cut evidence. Whatever video laryngoscope you have, just uh, make yourself comfortable with that. Uh, use airway adjuncts with video laryngoscopes and learn the troubleshooting. At times, you might be the most experienced operator managing the uh, airway in an emergency situation. So learn to troubleshoot also with those devices. So gum elastic bougies are also uh, a very useful adjunct during emergency. I would not go into the details of it, but I would like to emphasize a certain points that if you cannot achieve a CL grade of three or four, try not to put the bougie blindly. Specifically for four, please do not put the bougie blindly in an emergency situation because at that time it might be losing on time and the clock is ticking at the end in emergency. Uh, Frova intubating catheters have a universal connector at the end with, through which you can oxygenate while doing the airway management. So they are really helpful and I've been using this for quite a long time. Please use stilets which are meant for intubation. At times we use makeshift stilets which are not uh, proper and at times it, it is very difficult to take those stilets out of, out of the tube. And at times it's our tendency to do a J-shape of uh, stilleted endotracheal tubes Please make sure that you do not angulate the proximal part of the serrated tube to more than 35 degrees. Because if you angulate it more than 35 degrees, your serrated tube will go and hit the anterior commissure, and will be uh, it will be difficult for you to intubate with such a uh, shape in preformed tube. Uh, one more practical tip: if you, at times we don't get enough position, enough space to introduce our tube, you can ask your assistant to just pull the check of the patient so that you get a good space and uh, focus on the yes, good, and right part. You introduce your tube away from your field of vision so that you can get your line of sight right while intubating the patient. Coming to the supraglottic airway device is always a plan B. Uh, I'm sure Suprocele and IGEL are uh, the favorite ones, but they are new gener generation of supra newer supraglottic airway devices like Blockbuster and uh, Protector they aid super uh, optic guided intubation also. So if you cannot intubate a patient, feel free to put these 
and ventilate the patient. If you can achieve a ventilation, then arrange for a fiber optic as soon as possible and do a guided intubation through these devices. They are really handy. Last but not the least is cricothyroidotomy in the form of, in the form of front abdominal axis. These are the types of cricothyroidotomy that we talk about: needle percutaneous, head based, rapid four step, and the choice in emergencies is always open or surgical ones. Uh, these are the simple uh, device uh, equipments that are needed for a, a front of neck axis: a scalpel blade, uh, a, a lubricated bougie, and a size four or five size endotracheal tube. So the open or surgical method. Uh, at times, in, in, during emergency, we forget to locate the cricothyroid membrane properly. But for a successful cricothyroidotomy, the most important step is to locate the cricothyroid membrane. When in during emergency, if you have decided that you are going to go ahead with a fauna, take a deep breath, decide whether you need to really need to go ahead with that or not, identify the picothyroid membrane, the landmarks, then you go ahead and put a stab incision through the picothyroid membrane, rotate the needle, put a lubricated bougie through the incision, and railroad a, a, a tube and lubricated endotracheal tube over your bougie. There are kit-based picothyroidotomy sets available outside India, but they are not quite popular in India. Uh, Last resort is needle tricks. Uh, there are uh, stout uh, pre-formed uh, device, device for specifically for needle trichothyroidotomy, and they have very small lumen of 2 mm. And uh, in this needle trichothyroidotomy, try not to use our IV cannulas because they are kinkable. These uh, trichothyroidotomy cannulas are strong, flexible cannulas with high-grade Teflon. So I would advocate use of these in case of in case of emergencies. But through a uh, needle trick. Uh, the ideal uh, thing to oxygenate a patient should be a manuget, but you know the availability of manuget is really scarce. I'm not sure how many centers uh, have manuget in their emergency OTs and uh, emergency rooms. So there are some handheld devices available like Bentrain. It, it uses the standard oxygen source, and it, it is very handy and lightweight device, which can be useful in CICV situations in our upper airway obstructions. There are thin ultra-thin tubes available in the form of tri-tube, which is outer diameter of only 4 mm, which can be, uh, along with the ventre, and it can be really useful in uh, CICO situations. Uh, I will not go into the details of the uh, future prospectus, but AI and robotics is stepping into in every aspect of our life, and they are also stepping into the branch also. So reality techniques uh, where robotic endoscope mediated intubations are happening, they're even being simulated in emergency setting and they are quite they, they they are providing quite good results iris systems are also being in place and being studied so i'm sure in future we'll be using these things in our hospitals also and uh, with this the take home message from this presentation should be that it is very important to know your equipment and surrounding before actual emergency happens so prepare yourselves for the emergency then only you'll be able to perform at your best during emergencies add focus to uh, predict difficult airway, emphasize on para-oxygenation during emergency at all the times, master one VL which is available at uh, your institution, and consider early video laryngoscopy if you find it difficulty with the direct laryngoscopy. Do not consider, do not hesitate to consider intubation through subtopraglottic devices, and uh, practice fauna techniques. I I'm not sure how many of you have done a fauna in emergency situation, but you know we have to practice these things in workshops and uh, multiple simulated uh, centers where you can get a hold of these techniques. Because if you don't practice them during emergency, you might create more trouble while doing a fauna. So with this, I would like to emphasize, emphasize once again uh, for you all you to devise a strategy rather than just a plan. Make a complete plan, complete strategy comprising of different plans. And uh, that's how you defy uh, air emergencies. Uh, once again, I would like to congratulate the organizers for uh, organizing such an excellent program. Thank you, Naveen, sir, for the opportunity. And uh, thank you, everyone, for your patience. That's it from my side. Thank you, Dr. Abhijit, uh, for that uh, concise and precise uh, presentation of airway uh, management in the emergencies. Uh, thank you so much, sir. I'd like you rightly said, uh, one is uh, having drills, mock drills. Second right. is simulation. Right. Obviously, these are the ones we can't always have a emergency on your hand. So scenarios and mock drills and simulation is the only way. Simulation for technical expertise. 
and mock drills for uh, mock drills for having uh, you know coordination between all members of uh, people who are uh, involved especially code boot code blue teams so that's very important and uh, just a small other device that was available i think it's still available the bonfils uh, retrograde uh, retromolar uh, device is there that is i have found it to be extraordinarily useful yes sir yes sir uh, that is something that should be available in a crash cart or a difficult airway cart for at least for emergency so yes uh, everybody should learn to intubate through an sgd because it's a very easy way of doing it and even in a difficult airway you can both ventilate and try attempting it and the thing about uh, video laryngoscopes is the angulation the uh, the cmos technology that it uses the tip is angulated so you do require most of the times you will require a bougie or a stillet to uh, enter the trachea yeah. so right sir thank you thank you so much Nice, uh, Dr. Abhijit. Uh, I think that was uh, very concise, as Dr. Kopinat mentioned. Uh, Thank you. Sir. To comprehensively tell about the airway management within 15 minutes is very hard. I think you did justice to what uh, topic you had taken, and uh, I think it is an elaborate topic. Runs in for days for workshops and things like that. I think it's very important, as you said, uh, to practice, practice again in uh, uh, simulations and also in elective <coughs> scenarios. So right, that, uh, you you don't uh, end up surprised uh, during an emergency situation. I think that will be the only take home message, as you said. Thank you uh, for the entire organizing team and all the speakers were excellent. I think that Naveen has chosen uh, rightly uh, very nice speakers uh, who really stuck to the target and then uh, really presented very precise uh, topics. Uh, I always believe anybody cannot express beyond. 12 minutes on any topic, is, and there's no use having a 30, 40 minute lecture. The first uh, 12 minutes should completely concise whatever they're going to convey. So I think uh, the 15 minutes is uh, a wonderful platform. Uh, I think all the very best for the future program, Dr. Naveen, and uh, excellent effort. I think I'm all the best wishes to you and your team. Thank you so much for the opportunity inviting us. And but Dr. Uh, Darshan, I must say, these all your star speakers have been blessed by the presence of esteemed chairpersons. Well, even I am also <laughs> feeling that we are enjoying the discussions <laughs> and advices given by uh, Dr. Gopinath, sir. And uh, see, sir has been our mentor, teacher, so many publications to his credit, so many is on so many reviewer uh, boards of the journals. Uh, he's heading the department at ESI Medical College at Hyderabad, is very well respected senior. We learn it in, from him nitty gritties of publications also, about clinics also, about Tardec also. And uh, thank you very much, sir. And uh, uh, you have joined from Canadian uh, Hospital from Kuwait, where you're working as consultant and HOD of anesthesia. And uh, really, we all have been touched by uh, the presence. And Dr. Tej K. Paul, sir, who is always there, uh, is. He rightly told that around a decade ago, he retired as senior professor and head of Department of Anesthesiology at uh, DMC uh, Ludhiana, and he has been guiding us in our day-to-day -day life. But I still, before I, uh, I, I should not speak much, there have been few hands raised, so I'll invite them. Dr. Sunil Sethi has raised hand, Dr. Pankaj Gupta has raised hand. So uh, over to you, Dr. Sethi, and then I'll, in, uh, Dr. Amit Kohli has raised hand. Dr. Sethi, please. Good evening, everyone. and. Uh... It is a great privilege to be part of this group and uh, it was very nice to listen to all the speakers. They were so uh, enlightening to all the uh, delegates who were listening to it and especially Dr. Uh, uh, Shreya Agrawal. Since I am in practice from last uh, 25 years or so, uh, I will congratulate for your talk. And uh, every speaker has justified their talk. And uh, blessings from Dr. Teche Paul, sir, Dr. Sudarshan, sir, are there with us. And I will uh, say that everybody learns from everything. Um, Meenal was there, Dr. Neha is there, and all the speakers, I think. And discussion was also very good. And uh, I wish that we learn 
and this is an excellent platform dr navin has started so that uh, we can have a discussion and it is lovely to see so much discussion on the uh, whatsapp group also and uh, i will personally invite uh, for the 6th june program for the private practitioners since i am in practice i will love to see we practitioners are doing every job in day to day practice but we are hesitant to speak in front of a very senior uh, professors of medical college where we hesitate but uh, seeing so many youngsters in practice and they are talking about so many things one thing i will like to add for practitioners those who are listening to me uh, from very beginning i had a kit that consisted of pulse oximeter that time we used to carry pulse oximeter even portable boils apparatus a laryngoscope and we used to carry three boxes three attachi jisko bolte hain one carrying uh, pulse oximeter another carrying your brain circuit pediatric circuit laryngoscope and another carrying portable boils apparatus but one thing i made sure that as soon as i joined the practice i called all the uh, surgeons and i mean the surgical field uh, people whether they were from uh, radiology they were from uh, uh, <clears throat> obstetrics or surgery or orthopedics i called them i told them what we are and i told them if you are going to buy a new car new, new house please spend at least 50000 at that time it was uh, for a moderate boil separator it was 50000 i said please pay 50000 and if you don't have then start repaying me installments at that time i bought 10 boil separators in my city and that was the day that uh, i sold my boil separator portable boil separators to my junior and another thing i want to add at that time we used to carry pulse oximeter and we used to charge 500 rupees for per case at that time and gradually within a year all i mobilized the people and i am lucky to have dr rakhi as my surgeon peak in uh, obstetrics she was very supportive whether it was uh, for the charges to be implemented in the rotak city where navin and me were based initially and uh, it was wonderful working and uh, bless you all youngsters you were stars and love to see you thank you very much thank you, uh, thank thank you. dr sethi for those words and uh, uh, carrying forward uh, on 6 june we shall be having a program entitled p20 so since g20 is going on so dr sethi has initiated p20 where all the speakers will be private practitioners they will speak from 3 to 5 minutes about interesting case and case series so you are all encouraged to uh, participate and present and don't be shy it will be an open uh, platform and no difficult questions will be asked you will be able to share uh, experiences and the p20 series will be held on 6th of june uh, thank you dr sethi dr uh, thank you sir thank you very much dr pankaj gupta please yeah good evening everyone uh, real pleasure to listen to all of you Uh, I uh, attended the whole session, and I thought I have uh, been in practice for the last thirty-three years. We were private practitioner. I thought a lot of tips I would like to just give among most of the talks uh, regarding blocks, especially pediatric blocks. Even if you cannot in private, it's very difficult to have a urology setup. So, in all pediatric cases, a basic local infiltration should be a must. If you have the setup for giving urology block, nothing like it. But if you don't. at least infiltrate all the ports all the uh, skin incisions as much as possible in pediatric cases uh, regarding dr agrawal who started in ranchi see isa has uh, set down minimum standards in operation theaters we have a list of operation the drugs to be kept in the ot the setups the minimum standards all have been recommended by isa for the last 7 years in fact they are being upgraded right now so that is one important thing all of you should uh, If you are not aware of it, please go to the ISA website, download it, and show it to your surgeons. And uh, uh, I feel uh, anything to be private practitioner, I immediately my eyes open up and. Unmute, please unmute. Not one can unmute. Uh, uh, yeah. Hello. Yes. Yes. Please go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, sorry, I feel I was an incoming phone call. <laughs> so uh, I feel. Uh, see your setups before you start any case. Very important, especially if it's a first case. I know of some anesthetists who are coming to private practice. 
the first case was a dnc and unfortunately the patient arrested and died so there are nsd who have given up their practice and they never uh, came back to anesthesia because of such incidents that have happened so that's why i mean the discussions always help in in uh, molding everyone in their careers and of course uh, with dr navin sir starting this i feel there will be a lot of discussions more about private practice thank you thank you thank you everyone Uh, thank you, Dr. Pankaj, for those uh, nice words. And Dr. Ajit Vaishnav, sir, uh, sir is a very, very senior uh, practitioner from Rajkot. Held all the office bearer positions in ISA Gujarat and ISA Rajkot, and is the vice president of uh, ISA Family Benevolent Fund. Dr. Ajit Vaishnav, sir. Uh, Dr. Gupta, I am sending rec uh, these recommendations to uh, Dr. Shreya just now. Yes, sir. Receive them. <laughs> Uh, Dr. Vaishnav, sir, any comments from your side? Uh, sir, nothing. Uh, it was very nicely conducted program, and young speakers they are excelling the in presentation, excelling in the presentations. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, thank you for uh, those good words. But I must say that uh, uh, the experiences of the first duty as senior resident by Dr. Somya and uh, yes, Dr. Paul, sir, please over to you. i must i must say that all the speakers were excellent the my two co-chair persons in dr gopinath and dr sudarshan were superb and the young coordinators did a marvelous job but all this has been possible because of the efforts and the hard work put up by our dear Dr. Naveen Malhotra, I wonder how he gets all these bright and brilliant ideas. His passion to see that the fraternity of anesthesiology improves and makes long strides in future made him to create this KAP academic series. It has been extremely successful. i have been attending these webinars of different societies and other things for a very very long time but this is probably the first time today that i have seen that more than 200 participants participated today it speaks that how much efforts dr navin has put up all of the credit although the credit goes to the speakers but we should put on record the efforts put by dr navin so that he creates interest in the youngsters thank you sir thank you for those words but to be honest uh, it is all team work i am just uh, you can say a facilitator a guide and a friend to them thank you for those good words uh, i am obliged sir dr gobinath sir you have raised yes hand. please yes, yes please uh, I marvel at your energy levels, Naveen. I've always said that to you. I'm amazed at the way you think ahead. You are you are you are futuristic in everything that you have done, and providing a platform like this for all these youngsters. And I feel happy and blessed that I was part of the first uh, sort of webinar of this kind. And uh, may there be many more of these. and uh, at least by what i have seen of these speakers and everybody who participated amongst the younger lot i feel happy that we have good successes so i'm i'm really happy that you have chosen such wonderful people to speak and i'm sure you'll get many more of them and uh, obviously uh, we expect a lot more from you and uh, i'm sure you will deliver that i'm I, i'm very extraordinarily i'm very sure about you knowing knowing you so well all the best and congratulations and god bless thank you sir thank you thank for I, i thank i thank my uh, respected uh, professor tej sir and uh, kasturi also for joining me and all the team members of uh, you up kap program that you did thank you for uh, the great experience thanks thank you for those good words and uh, blessings sir and uh, i think we got final two hands coming up uh, amit kohli and dr minal chohan minal chohan is our first uh national annual yuva orator so and amit kohli uh, is our uh, co-team member of 
you uh, ISA. So Amit, first you, and then Vinil, finally from you, and then I'll hand over back to uh, because we are uh, almost nine o five. So we should keep a track of time. Also, I think another five minutes uh, we should uh, be closing it. So Amit, and then Vinil. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, actually, it was a wonderful uh, event. I have been to a lot of webinars which we have seen, but I was glued to this since six thirty onto the screen. because of all vision and efforts by you we have been seeing everybody is talking a lot about you but we have, we have very closely seen you executing the things and we know how much this execution takes an efforts that's itself a vision the topic the concept you know the screen everything was talking hundred of words about the efforts done by your vision supported by my dear friends nishant and monica and i would not um, uh, failing to mention about two yuva coordinators who have done uh, amit and uh, neha who have been worked as a team this is there the speakers were fantastic uh, they justified the topics given to them the airway topic is very close to my heart right that is there uh, well justified along with uh, some common topics like how we the challenges we faced amazing talk by all the speakers and uh, the heights which sir you have taken to the isa in last 3 4 years right uh, we have never seen in last uh, many many decades and that is particularly there and one last remark which i want to put down about this kat series today first session is not only the topics but along with that the speakers are from different parts of the country representing the entire nation that is one good thing which i have seen so energy is still end the last over amazing from everyone thank you very much thank you amit and over to you minal yes thank you so much sir so um right uh, a very warm good evening to everybody who's present here now you know when i was speaking to sir very recently um he really wanted me to talk about the national yuva oration because that is the biggest and the most beautiful award which i have got in the past few years and let me tell you it's so close to my heart and when it flashes on the screen whenever i'm going and presenting or i'm speaking as a speaker it really makes me feel very 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 proud and i would like to thank sir for his vision thank everybody who was behind this concept of of having a national yuva oration uh see you know a little bit about what exactly happened and how it happened so initially this is for all the youngsters out here who would like to participate in the national yuva oration which is held uh, there is a good enough time limit which is given and you are given three topics you have to make a small presentation which is about 5 minutes and then the way you present the way you speak and your matter all of that is judged by a very efficient jury now if i i'm not sure but uh, you know when i participated i was told that there were more than 1000 entries which were there so it takes a huge amount of time for them to screen all these entries and then ultimately to be there on the podium and speak see there is nothing which can stop you it's only you yourself who stops you from going forward so if you have the passion if you have if you want to just go there be confident about whatever you want to convey because my topic was so beautiful which was given to me by isa itself which was uh, anesthesiologists in front of the curtains which we definitely are now and we are doing it more and more by various programs like these which are you know bringing us to the forefront um, so it is just audience interaction and after i finished with my oration uh, you know there was we ended with the agni path lines which i think sir you know now i don't remember them but we ended with the agni path lines only and then sir came on stage and he continued to you know resonate those lines it was the most magnificent time i i can just say in my entire life the last time i think i was so happy was in my 10th boards and 12th boards and after this it was this so uh, i would encourage all the youngsters please participate in this particular uh, initiative we have we are just very lucky that you know you people are and and i'm just about to touch my 40 so you know i think i was manifesting it very very you know quietly that you know i should be able to get this yuva oration and i got it and uh, be you know come forward participate send your entries 
I can't tell you how it's going to enrich your life and how important and happy you'll feel. Besides, you know, you also get a free stay in one of the best hotels wherever it is planned. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Meenal. And yes, you should learn from her how to become the national yoga orator. And uh, I hand it back over to Nishan and Monica. Uh, over to you, the our chief coordinators for today. Thank you so much, sir. And last but not the least, I want to thank all the participants to encourage our U.S. stars and uh, for making this session so wonderful and successful. So now I would like to uh, invite Dr. Nishan to say a few words. Uh, thank you, Dr. Monica. I think we are towards the fag end of uh, the session. And I really, really feel that it has been one of the very, very nice sessions uh, simply because of the speakers and the quality of their talk. I mean, really, really nice. I mean, uh, in fact, even I have been attending a lot of webinars, sir must be knowing. And uh, it was really nice today. It was very good. And uh, regarding uh, the, 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 uh, the little session by Meenal, uh, you know, you were brilliant. And you were brilliant because you were chosen amongst, you know, almost the whole country. And that uh, that oration, the you oration, I was there, and and it it gave us goosebumps. So you know, when you are good, and you are projected on a big platform, and that is the beauty of these your conferences, Dr. Navin Malhotra sir, uh, is giving has given, and I'm sure will continue to give opportunities to the young, and the worthy to showcase their talent and to grow and you know to be seen uh, throughout the country. So uh, with those words, I think, uh, uh, Dr. Monica, can we uh, conclude the session? Thank you so much, Dr. Nishan. So I would like to request all the participants to please keep on adding the feathers in the cap of ISA. So this is all uh, for this session. Thank you so much. And over to Nea uh, for the introduction for the final conclusion and next webinar, please. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Coming from a Yuba coordinator, being on the younger side of the spectrum, I am sure Dr. Amit and I both will agree that we have such great people to look forward to making an very interesting for all of us. I think session today. And I'd like to tell everyone that this is just the beginning. Uh, continuing with this CAP Academic series, we have another session, another interesting session for the upcoming Tuesday. Career prospects and specialities of anesthesiology. We will be discussing on cardiac anesthesia, pediatric anesthesia, critical care, neuroanesthesia, pain medicine, and palliative care. So, looking mm -hmm. forward to continued updation of knowledge, attitude, and practices in mm -hmm. anesthesiology. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Thank you, all chairpersons, speakers, the UA star speakers, coordinators, teachers, friends colleagues, and dear friends, we come to the close of CAP Academic Series Session 1 on Yuva Stars. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thanks, everybody. Bye, bye. Thanks, everybody. Bye, bye, bye. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Thanks, Good night. Thank you. Thank you.